And welcome to the 28 Studios podcast with that. <laughs> uh, brought to you, recorded live at the Stude at 258 Studios in Scranton, Pennsylvania. So um, we haven't been around in a while. Um, that is our fault. Um, unfortunately, we are not uh, uh, sponsored or working for a company like Viacom or whatever. But if you want to, make sure you get in touch with us. Yeah, we like <laughs> to talk about stuff. We like to talk about it for a long time. But uh, first, like, I, I don't think we've, I, we haven't done something since somebody, someone. Yes. Which is because uh, we've been so busy. Um, and I hate using that as an excuse, but it's a truth. Um, so I just want to let people know about somebody, someone real quick is that, um, so we, we were fortunate enough to have, um, Marianne Oliveri and Jackie Miles and, and, and Marianne and her husband, Dave wanted to do something, a memory of their daughter, Sarah. And, and we were fortunate enough to make this video called somebody, someone, um, uh, about a, a opioid awareness. And, uh, we are now at over 150,000 organic views where we paid zero, zero. cents zero to no get out sponsors there. um but you know everybody who is a part of it we want to thank you and everyone who shared it um Josh who was on the podcast prior to that Josh one Rosengrant. is uh now doing speaking engagements and mm -hmm. and and talking about his addiction and and I want to let the world know that he is now free of charges yes they were expunged and he graduated from drug court and we are very very proud of josh because he is a good good human being mm -hmm. um, and he introed the video to somebody someone at the drug grad graduation that yes. he was graduating at that he was graduating at that yep. but in and he was and he was kind enough to come down and and be an extra in a, in, in the background of the of the final dance moment that happened so um, anybody who can, who can watch that and share it and spread the message, there's going to be some, uh, words coming out, uh, in the next few months about, uh, the direction that somebody, someone is going and it's going to be, in my opinion, a very positive, um, data driven, um, optimistic, helpful, just think of all of those adjectives that are, that make you feel good. Mm -hmm. Somebody, someone's going to do that. And Marianne Oliveri wants zero credit for any of it, but she deserves all of it. Yes. <clears throat> um, in the interim, uh, Stacy just got back from England and Ireland and Ireland, Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. which did you have a good time? Oh uh, yeah, I had. Amazing Was it damp? Time. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, it's England. Always... England is not a dry it's, anything. It's my second home. <laughs> um, and Stacy's very, uh, very knowledgeable about her family history and went and visited all those places. Whereas, like my family from West Side. <laughs> um, today's guest, I, I, you know, since I got sober in 2008, I, I, I was always interested in politics, even back until I remember, I remember being, uh, seven years old and, and loving Michael Dukakis, mm -hmm. um, which for a seven year old is very strange. Yeah. But so from there, and I, and I remember Senator Casey or Governor Casey, um, being our governor and running. And I remember being very interested in, in Bill Clinton because he played the saxophone in Arsenio Hall. Um, but, you know, when I, after I got sober, I, I really a lot listened to Mr. Steve Corbett on WILK. And um, he's, 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 number one, I think he's, he's, he's a great journalist. So I also think that he's not out there to make friends, and he will tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> so... I I respect um, Steve Corbett's honesty. I expect I respect his integrity, and I respect his his uh, unwavering desire to speak truth to power. Um, I can respect all of that in an individual, whether or not I agree with them or not. And a lot of the things I agreed with Steve on. Um, so for me to get him to come in here and talk with us, I think was, was, was to me a, a little milestone in, in, you know, our, my little NAPA life. So, um, Steve Corbett is our guest today. It's going to be, it's a, it's, it's a, it's definitely a roller coaster ride and he's a phenom. He's, he's a raconteur. He's incredibly intelligent. I don't think a lot of people realize his, his 
his background, where he came from. Mm-hmm. Um, this, this is a side that I know I've never seen before. Yeah, were you, were you completely blown I, away by? I loved it. I loved this entire podcast. And I were you were great. you a little apprehensive at first? Well, of course. I mean, because I mean, I was I worked in in the media uh, for over a decade in the area, and you know, you you kind of think that you know somebody, especially just seeing a how they figure, are, especially yes. a public figure. But yeah. then. This is a chance for you to get to know him as a person, and it just completely changed everything. It for really you. did for me personally, and it was great, and it was all for the good. So I'm super glad, and so I. And maybe we'll be the fortunate people that every now and again get Steve to come in and 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 speak some truth. I want to hear more stories. Oh, he's great. <laughs> um, so maybe we can make it sort of this this uh, <laughs> quarterly thing. Quarterly with Corbett. Quarterly with Corbett. <laughs> um, so uh, that's it. We're going to try to get a couple more podcasts in before the end of the year, if we can, um, just because, you know, we're so busy. And, and anytime we we look at the calendar and we're like, oh, there's a blank space. Maybe we could do a podcast yeah. then. Um, so we thank you all for listening. We hope you enjoy this. We are. I'm not going to cut it in half. Um, you can find it on uh, iTunes, Google Play, Facebook, YouTube. Um, please, please watch, please listen, please share. Um, we appreciate even if only one person listened or, or watched, we appreciate you. Yes. Um, thanks because <laughs> that's more than our parents watch. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> or listen. So true. without further ado, let's talk to Mr. Steve Corbett, who's pushing his book, Blood Red Syrah. Did I say that right? Syrah? Yes. Okay. Let's I, get to the intro. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Aikido is a, is is more of a, a spiritual training with partner. So you attack me, and I enter into that attack. The techniques, the physical techniques, are, are pretty sophisticated, but you're entering in and you're moving with your bad energy to redirect it into another place. But if at all possible, to not hurt your attacker. That's Aikido. That's drawn from Aiki Jiu-Jitsu. Right. Aiki Jiu-Jitsu is the raw battlefield combat samurai application of like being Like the Krav Maga of... You, yeah. Well, well, yeah, but that's, that's Israeli. This is all pure uh, feudal Japan. I have very terrible references. You drop... No, you're cool. <laughs> you you're trying. Your, you drop your sword on the battlefield, and you still have your sword. So with Aiki Jiu-Jitsu and the training as well, It's defensive, but it is severely offensive. You move in fast, you break, if at all possible. And then you get out. A lot of joint work, and you get out. Okay? So people have said, when you train with a partner in Aikido, there's a lot of smiling. And there is. You're working with somebody. When you're training with a partner in Aiki Jiu-Jitsu, there's a lot of screaming. And there is. Because the, 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 the techniques, when applied, hurt. Yeah. All right? So anyway. My they're not meant was, to be good. No, they're not meant to be good. They're, they're, you know, what, what, at the risk of sounding like a complete savage, they're, <laughs> they're killing techniques. Right, okay? right, right. They're killing techniques. Yes. Uh, I used to train uh, EI Jiu-Jitsu, mm-hmm. which is samurai sword, traditional samurai sword, drawing and cutting. I trained for Holy years. Holy shit. For really? years, yeah. I trained for years. And you could say to people, it's a Japanese killing art. And, of course, they know you got a sword in your hand. They recognize that you can die if you're hit with a sword or yeah. cut with a sword. But Aiki Jiu-Jitsu is on an open hand, no sword, no killing weapon. So when you tell people you train in a killing art, they look at you like you're more mentally unstable <laughs> yes. than if you had a sword in your hand. You know what I mean? But, I mean, there's people that do, like, all these different, there's so many disciplines about self-combat yeah. all over the world. Yeah. You know, and you mentioned something about spirituality, yeah. and, and, I, and I think that a lot of people don't understand the difference between re- being religious yes. and being spiritual. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure, absolutely. And is that more is that more akin the, to your your the, sentiment is to be? It, it, is, it is for mine. A lot of people don't follow any kind of a spiritual uh, world or, or or path. I like to believe that for a long time I have, and even in my application of of. Aiki Jiu-Jitsu technique, 
I tell students, I tell people with whom I train, one big difference, for example, is between Aikido and Aikido Jiu-Jitsu. In, in Aikido, I can use a technique that will put you to the ground but not break your arm. Right. With Aikido Jiu-Jitsu, my decision is whether or not to break your arm. But the breaking of your arm is always... But, I mean, how many, like, milliseconds is that decision made in? It, it, it happens in the midst of the attack. It, it happens when you're being attacked. And you can take all of this all of this dojo training and apply it to your own life and to your own individual attitude toward dealing with uh, verbal uh, I mean, is that arguments. about, but that's about, is that about discipline? Is that yeah, about self-discipline? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's about self-discipline. And most people don't have, most people lack self-discipline and, and most people aren't true. willing and, to work at it. And I'm, and I'm assuming that the, the, you don't want to have to use it. No, mm-hmm. you absolutely don't because you, you, you will definitely hurt somebody. And I tell everybody in the dojo, I'm just, I'm just a little old senior citizen. I'm afraid of everybody. <laughs> right, right. Right. Please leave me alone. Uh. Uh, please leave me alone. And, 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 and then they start to realize that there is something wrong with me. Okay. <laughs> Other than the fact that I'm a little old senior citizen living in the hill section of Scranton. Well, uh. you know, th- giving this and, 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 and referencing yourself in that way, I mean, I, there, I think we can all agree. I mean, especially based on your bio. Yeah. There's a, there's a severe contrast to that statement. About how you got started. So where, like, where did you grow up? Like, where did you, where were you, like, born and my, raised? My roots, my genetic roots, are right up in Saint Joe Cemetery in the Manuka section of Scranton. Get the, get out on of my here. dad's side. Really, five generations in Scranton. My grandfather came over from Ireland in like 1904. Wound up working 45 years in the coal mines as oh, a coal God miner, bless him. as a laborer. Uh, died from black lung, which is the corporate benefit that uh, he received from the I mean, there was mine no, bosses. No mm-hmm. protections back then. No. no. None. And my grandmother, uh, who married my, my immigrant grandfather, was from, and this is where it gets interesting, northeastern Pennsylvania, but I'm not really clear where. I never met her. She was dead when I was born in 1951. But she actually was, I believe, born in Scranton. But an American citizen, obviously. Yeah. And a little known fact in northeastern Pennsylvania and in America is that many women born in the United States, born in the USA, lost their American citizenship when they married so-called foreigners. Get the fuck? Really? Yeah, absolutely. So th- the history is there. Because she's all genealogy, is, ancestry, yeah, love loves it. All loves you got to do is look <laughs> at the history. Yep. And I don't know how many women in northeastern Pennsylvania, Italians, Polish, mm-hmm. but Irish I know for a fact lost their American citizenship as punishment for marrying so-called foreigners. My, my grandmother, when women got the right to vote in 1920, wasn't even able to vote then because she wasn't a citizen. She was born in, in the United States. How do they take away the citizenship? Good old American government uh, can the do what Irish, good old American the government Ir- want to do. I was you and I have conversations him, about this. Well, we just did because I just got back. I was working last week in London and in Dublin. Yeah. So um, I, I was just shocked even just to hear how the Irish were, you know, the, the what's the word? Like, you don't, I have you don't, the word, you, but it's not PC yeah, to the, say. Yeah, the MPC, I mean, they were, the Irish were treated worse than I think any other yeah, group. Yeah, but everywhere. In the, maybe it in the history everywhere. of the world. It, it, it's, it's part there was and a parcel. weird stigma that came with them. Yeah, it's part and parcel of, of the American history uh, many people don't want to know about yeah. and don't want to acknowledge when you talk about lynchings among mm-hmm. African Americans in the South. We're just now, as a country, starting to even open our eyes to, to our own bad history. Right. But when my grandfather came to Scranton, Originally went to Pittsburgh, said it was too dirty. The, the mills were too dirty. So I, he'd I come bet. back here and work wait, in the coal mines. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. He came back here? And he did. So he was here, and uh, 10 children, five boys, five girls. I uh, got to love the uh, Irish. Living in the, in the little house that's still there down on Cedar Avenue. Right. Uh, all the kids born there. And my dad went on the Pennsylvania State Police at the end of World War II. No the, shit. The five boys, uh, four of the boys were... In the, the military during World War II, the fifth gene was already on the state police. And my dad was a terrific boxer, so the pugilism uh, is in my genes as well. <laughs> and when my dad got home, his, his plan was to take a year off and drink and punch guys in bars and just Which generally be really, a Manuka guy. My Irish side really liked it. Sure. Not, not the violence, but mm. sure. all the other stuff. Oh, yeah. He wanted to argue and he wanted to take that year yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. 
and his and then he was going to train to in his mind become the heavyweight champion of the world because he was that good uh, in the ring and a magazine called Pick Magazine, which was the equivalent of Life or Look Magazine, right. picked my dad as what they then called one of the great white hopes because Joe Lewis was the great heavyweight mm-hmm. champion in yeah. the world. So my father was all set. He was going to become the heavyweight champion of the world, and some people thought he could have been the heavyweight champion of the world at six foot one, 172 pounds, a string what? bean. Wow. He could, he could box very, very well, and he could hit. Very, very hard. Do people know this about your family? Uh, they do from the old days. A right. lot of people a lot of people know because I've written about my dad over decades. I've talked about him on the air. I didn't really get that much into my mother's German Protestant divorced heritage, which is equally, if not more so important, right. because mm-hmm. when they met, they really were Romeo and Juliet. You didn't come back to Irish Catholic yeah. Manuka right. when you were German Protestant divorced. Yes. And my father, to his credit, said, we're together. And so they didn't get married in the, the church. They got married at a, a magistrate's office in Maryland because my dad, as a state trooper, was, was stationed in York, right. Pennsylvania, which is where I was born, which is where he met my mother, the infamous Dorothy Louise Hess. And of course, oh no, her last name's Hess. Hess. Oh no, and that's the German. That guy uh, ruined it for everybody. It named Hess. Hess. <laughs> he sure did. But there's there, there's always Hermann Hess who wrote Sid Arthur. So he's that's the, okay. He's the saving grace. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Rudolf was not my uncle, contrary no. to popular belief. And Hitler ruined that mustache for everybody. I'm telling you, man. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so my dad was on the state police, and as a result, we got transferred as a family all over central Pennsylvania. York, Harrisburg, and I grew up in the Harrisburg area. I eventually went to high school at a rural, uh, small high school in Perry County, which is is rural, white, blue collar, rough America. Yeah, and that's where I went to high school. After after high school, I wound up at Penn State, up in University Park, and after five years to graduate, I took an extra year because I was. Particularly, you to be a doctor. I was particularly yeah. committed to my studies. <laughs> and, and a boy. And, and, and I have a degree in community development. Really? A bachelor of Science degree in community development. But that encompasses the six-month hiatus I took in South Florida in 1973 when I was supposed to graduate college. And I wound up working Wait, as... Daytona? I, no, I was in <laughs> Fort Lauderdale, and I was working as a social greeter at the Parrot Lounge. No shit. And that Ooh. meant that when the bikers would come in and <laughs> tell us that they're not taking off our colors, as a social greeter, I would say, let me talk to your president. And I would explain, look around the parrot lounge. The guys who are all bigger than me, who look crazier than I am, right. are also social greeters. <laughs> but I am the sanest of the social <laughs> greeter right. tribe. And so I'm here to tell you that you can't win in here. Yeah. You can't possibly win in here. Yeah. We sell seven beers for a dollar. That was the draw at the Paramount. Oh, House. shit. Wow. Seven beers for a dollar. And I was, uh, as a social greeter, responsible for trying to head off as much violence as possible. But when it kicked, we took care of business. But I, so, so, I mean, I, I personally think that you have a distinguished career. Oh, it's mm-hmm. very distinguished. Yeah, I, it, so, I mean, to go from to go from that, right? Your, yeah. Your, your your heritage growing up, your sure. dad. I mean, I, sure. I don't I don't know what your relationship with your dad was like. Perfect, wonderful. And and that's and that's really incredible and he had his too. problems. Yeah, as, and it, as, I mean, everybody as does. do we all. Yes. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. all do. Sure. Um, mm-hmm. how I mean, how do those experiences shape? I mean, did you did you feel like a calling or or maybe a personal goal I'm, to say I'm somebody who is interested in human behavior I'm somebody I'm fascinated who, who by is it. interested in why people do what they do mm-hmm. to themselves why people do what they do to each other That's why I watch mm-hmm. World War II documentaries Absolutely yeah. How absolutely did you convince this whole nation to go along absolutely. with you Absolutely mm-hmm. yeah. absolutely And and as a result when I realized if I stayed in South Florida and cocaine was just coming into South Florida yeah. in 1973. I saw all the cocaine cowboy stuff when it was it was out of control. Yeah, and, and like murders and every day. And... First time I ever saw cocaine, I didn't know what it was. Yeah, and all of a sudden I'm I'm in a bar in a nightclub scene. We would finish up at two o'clock, 
uh, at the Parrot. I'd get a ride down to the to the Hollywood, Florida, Miami border. Hollywood is a little town right on the border of Miami. Yeah. And we would go down to the flying machine, and the flying machine was open until 4 in the morning. We closed at 2. Flying machine was open until 4. What's the flying yeah. machine? It was a nightclub. Oh, yeah. I thought it was literally like... No, no. Aye. Oh, no, man. It was a nightclub. And to this day, it's the only bar club I have ever experienced or heard of that when the lights came on to signal last call at like quarter to four, yeah. they put the lights on and there would be bouncers walk around in karate gis with black belts. No and shit. They would walk wow. around barefoot in their geese, and they would explain, please finish your drink. It's time to go. And I never heard of such a thing in my entire life. It makes more sense than this thugged out, like, you know, this, oh, this yeah. guy who looks like a WWE wrestler. Well, these, these were interesting guys themselves. And like I say, cocaine was rampant. Uh, amyl nitrate in a in a Vicks oh, that uh, inhaler, the, that was poppers. Yeah. That yeah. was yeah. poppers. Oh, yeah. poppers. That was Quaaludes. rampant. <laughs> Quaaludes were Late not 70s, so right? much. Nah, Quaaludes. I remember in the early seventies when I was at Penn State, when I was mm-hmm. in State College, and and maybe when I got back from Florida, maybe seventy three, maybe seventy three. I remember, and 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 mostly, I didn't know a lot of guys who used Quaaludes. I knew I knew young women. Who mm-hmm. used they were, they were, who were using for downs. postpartum? When, wasn't it? For... I don't even know. Uh, they were downs, and, yeah. and yeah. most of the people I knew weren't doing downs. Right? Uh, they were they were doing they amphetamines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You were you were doing White Cross uh, uh, pills, amphetamines. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cross I, I, I ran I ran into <laughs> methamphetamine for the first time at that mm-hmm. time, and that was like an ex-convict biker drug. Yeah, just but, for the folks listening, meth isn't new. No, yeah. not even close. But it's no. redneck science. They gave science. it to the Nazis in World War II, so they keep fighting. Re- it's redneck science now, though. It seems, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> well, it, it 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 is it is a drug that had an appeal, uh, as as all drugs do. Mm-hmm. Sure. And and that's one of the aspects of drug use that I'm complaining isn't heard about as often as it needs to. People get high because they want to feel good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They want to feel good. Yep. It's not necessarily escaping. But, no. but it is to an extent. You just want to get high. You want to feel good. That's yeah. why people drink. That's can, also why can people. I, yeah. Can I offer an observation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Stacy's sober. I'm sober. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been known to partake in some earthly flower every now and again. Yeah, sure. Um, but you know, life, and I, I and I can even, I can even imagine this in the hunter gatherer days, where it's like, at some point, you just need to go. I need to escape from because yeah. my. I always had this saying where being with yourself is a terrible way to spend your day. <laughs> so to escape for a moment, just here's for what's a moment. It's, it's, a, it's a different kind of high. They all I, are. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. high now by virtue of enjoying being in your company, enjoying oh, telling some stories. I'm so, I'm, this I'm, is so uh, uh, right. No, oh. I'm, I'm dead serious. You can come back anytime. <laughs> do you do birthday parties? <laughs> I, I do, I do. I come in and I tell the kids the truth. Uh, yeah, you're like, well, your government's I, fucking you. I want <laughs> you, I want you. So, but, but, but it's a different kind of high uh, at night. I, I like when I'm finished with my day, I go to the wine. Mm-hmm. I open up the wine and I drink my wine at night. Do you know what I do now? Yeah. Do you ever hear a cava? Oh, I have, and I and, and I'm not familiar with it. I've never done it. So cava, I found it online. I know and he it, had it's me totally, do it. It's totally legal. It's totally allowed. It's this root from Fiji. Yeah. And and it's a very tribal thing. They, oh yeah, yeah. They sit around yeah. and you have to put it in like a cheesecloth. Mm-hmm. And, but I'll tell you what, man. You take a sip of it and you're supposed to drink like you know. Here's I've how much read you- about it. Mm-hmm. I right. got some, man, if you want to try it. Totally legal. Now, now, now this is what's interesting, and you're raising an interesting uh, issue here. And, and then I'll get back later to my, 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 my yes. meandering yes. path yeah. that <laughs> brought me here Welcome uh, to the with 25 you today. Podcast. Okay, no, it's good. It's good. <laughs> Squirrel. <laughs> when people get high, they want to feel better. Yes. Uh, they really do. Even yeah. if you're in the, in, in the worst time of your life, if you're, if you're going to a substance, yeah. there's a good chance for a short period of time you, you want to feel better. You want to get high. Temporary. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, yeah. and, then comes the consequences sure. of your choices. Absolutely. Absolutely. Whether it's alcohol, whether it's uh, cocaine, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Opioids. So, so we know the damage done by substances. We know that. And there are a lot of different reasons substances are available. Ask the pharmaceutical corporations why they manufacture substances. Ask the physicians why they prescribe them. Oh, yeah. Ask, ask the drug dealer on a corner why she or he. 
uh, deals them. Because there's and, money. And you'll find, yeah, money's a big motivator. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But but I haven't smoked a joint in 35 years. I haven't used an illegal drug in about 35 years. Really? But, absolutely. But I'm interested in all this. Mm-hmm. In, in, my, in my younger days, I, of course... Used cocaine sure. when I was mm-hmm. in South Florida. Of course. And liked mm-hmm. it. Yeah. But also recognized there's danger here. Yeah. There's danger here. LSD is another one. Recognized, whoa, danger here, organic yeah. masculine. And I'm talking about 1969. I'm talking about 1970 when the counterculture and life was changing. Music was changing. Society was changing for younger people. And at that time... Talking to you now as a guy who's 67 and a half years old, I was 18 years old. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm doing organic mescaline. And I'm saying to a buddy of mine. That's the cactus, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm saying to a buddy of mine, as they're pressing a can of shaving cream, they're pressing the button, and the shaving cream is coming out, and everybody's just laughing and laughing, and it just <laughs> keeps coming out and coming out. And I turned to this guy, and I said, you realize, man, that if this doesn't wear off, we're seriously <laughs> mentally <laughs> ill. We're yeah. screwed. We don't. We're screwed. We don't have the ability to deal on a normal level. Right. And I was fascinated that an organic substance could alter your brain or the chemicals mm-hmm. in your brain and and make you that much different. That's when some of the bells went off in my head, and and I recognized I was always good at recognizing danger. Whether it be LSD, whether it be organic mescaline, cocaine, whether it be alcohol, whatever the substance is, pot. When yeah. I was smoking weed, I got to the point where I, I felt a little paranoid with it. Right. Mm-hmm. If I'm smoking weed 35, 40 years ago, I would stop the conversation. I wouldn't be having this conversation. I'd be wanting to listen more to music. I'd want to hear chords that I hadn't heard before that I've found in a song. Oh, you I'd do be that stuff like you're a massive music fan? I'd be fan? stoned. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love it. But I'd be stoned. I'm yeah. stoned. I'm wrecked. I'm yeah. not here to have a conversation. I can have this kind of conversation without a drink, without anything. But I also, I like to have a drink, and I like to have a conversation while I'm having a drink. But substance abuse is abuse across the board. How, when you deal with people who need help with substances, do you really get into their concerns about themselves and mm-hmm. sometimes now, it takes a psychiatrist sometimes it takes we, I, i'm an ex-drug counselor we we've done we've done our last two podcasts prior to you uh, we're both about heroin and the opioid addiction yeah. mm-hmm. we just we just yeah uh, we were fortunate enough to do this video called somebody someone yeah about but, opioid awareness I, I saw that and it's good um, that you did that yeah and i i i just couldn't believe the response that we got and and a lot of the people in the system that we talk to you know i have this i have this way of thinking when i got when i got sober and we'll get we'll get back we'll yeah, yeah, to, yeah. No, we're cool. to the fucking tangents no we're good we're good um <laughs> no, we're you know good. i i when i was in high school i was 15 years old one of my good friends at the time went went away for nine months because of addiction and he came back and and i would go to aa meetings i would support him i would do whatever i could but at the same time i was still drinking and and, and right. doing what i did um, it gave me a great insight to that that AA world. Sure. And then when I got sober, I was like, okay, I made a decision to get sober because I see my life and it's not going to be well. Um, so I'm going to do the AA stuff. And after two weeks in AA, I, I looked at everybody and I said, I'm sorry, I'm never coming back. Why aren't you coming back? You're going to be a dry drunk. You're going to fail. You're going to. And I'm like, because you make me want to drink. You know, I was in a big book meeting with a guy who was 50 years sober, and I'm like, if you haven't figured out that you need to get on with your life and not think of, because the trick that worked for me was try not to think about it. Mm -hmm. Try not to think Mm -hmm. about alcohol. Be distracted Mm -hmm. at work. That was mine too. Right. Make your projects. Do what you got to do, but you have to distract yourself from the things that that hurt you. So how long have you not had a drink? Uh, Eight and a half years. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. And and you don't drink either. Um, I drink every once in a while. I haven't drank in a while. You have like half a glass of Yeah, but I I, I was more pills, cocaine, um, but I'm clean 15 years. Can I tell you you a quick impressive thing about her? Yeah, yeah. Graduate to Oxford, taking 80 painkillers a day. Yeah. Oxford in England. I went to school there. Isn't that incredible? Well, they have such low standards that it's no wonder they <laughs> got the degree. 
<laughs> you know how the British are. And thank Took God, you, right? They'd have given you that degree had you uh, <laughs> yeah, been like, like, carted in on a donkey cart. No, yeah, I'm kidding. We, we got to no, get, we gotta no, get this yeah, American yeah, yeah. girl who's no. giving us problems. <laughs> no, um, it's uh, no, it's important. And, and I, but I think I think yeah. I think right now, like, the, so when the war on drugs happened in the eighties, they in the seventies, it was a war on drugs, right? But, but I got to go back here. Why did you quit? Why were you able to quit eventually? Because I incorporated on on uh, August first, two thousand ten, and and by August eighth, I went. Oh, this is not okay. going to be a successful right. business. <laughs> and and why and how did you quit? Um, I just hit and rock mine was bottom. Time. Mine was time. Mine, yeah. mine. I had been doing it for four or five years and right. hiding it, and I knew that I was depressed. But it was just I hit that point, and then I ran out. And I was living over there, and they couldn't send anything, and I mm-hmm. couldn't go to the doctors. So mm-hmm. it was the first time in five years, and I went through withdrawal. And I'll tell you what, thank God I wrote about it because I go back and yeah, I'm she like, she journaled I, everything. I well, I also tell people that. Your luck eventually can run out. Absolutely, and, and you you can die. Sure. You can. My husband did. Yeah. I lost okay. him seven well, years ago. To I'm it. sorry. And, and, and there you know what I'm <laughs> saying. So you saw bo- you, both you know sides of the coin. It, mm-hmm. it can it can happen. Uh, your heart can stop uh, sure. as a result of a, of a reaction. Uh, you can you can be in a in a situation where you can get hurt. Uh, you can get shot. You can be uh, in in a variety of places where you can be high and step off a curb. And I mean, well, every day is Russian roulette. It's all there. Sure it is. Yeah. yeah. Sure it is. Mm-hmm. And so so before your luck runs out. I'll tell people if you're if you're really truly interested in stopping, and that's really what it boils down to. You gotta want to stop. Yeah. I used you, to tell guys in the prison, I can provide you with tools, let's say. Yeah. But you gotta use the tools. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I can't use them for you, and I'm not here to hold your hand. I'm not here to coddle you because that's a junkie's game. A junkie yeah. plays that yep. all the time. Yeah, it's all manipulation. And, and that's yeah. why yeah. I was a hated drug counselor because I would tell them real clear. I know what you're doing. I see what you're doing. And I'm not going to play that game. I'm not mm-hmm. going to let you game me. I'm not going to let you play me. I'll help you if I can. Yeah. But if I can't. So but you got to want it. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You're never going to change any addict's mind unless it, unless yeah. they change their own. I stopped. The last joint that I had was when I got my first weekly newspaper job. And I thought, I can't be smoking weed, which is against the law. Right. If I'm going to start digging into politicians' behavior and their ethical, mm-hmm. moral Because you'd be behavior, a hypocrite. I'd be a yes. hypocrite. Yeah. And, but it was important to me not to be a hypocrite. Abs- yeah. And yeah. that was it. That was it. When, when, when my wife, Stephanie, and I met, she picked me up in a bar in Harrisburg, and all I had, I had like a couple Hawaiian shirts, a pair of cowboy boots, and a typewriter. And she, she had a Corvette. Who the fuck dressed you? Hunter she, Thompson? She had... <laughs> she had a uh, Corvette. She had a nice apartment on the twenty fourth floor of a of a of a building in Harrisburg. She had a full time job, and in the morning, she was going to work, and she said, "Okay, all right." And I said, "Stephanie, that's your name, right, Stephanie?" <laughs> I checked your refrigerator. You got steam shrimp and Heineken. I'll see you when you get home. And she said. My girlfriends told me, gentlemen, leave in the morning. And I said, I'll see you when you get home. Now, she could have called a SWAT team, but she must have recognized charm and brilliance. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's February 12th, 1981. And uh, I didn't what go What a home. recall for I didn't you. Go home I know. Since. It's easy. Lincoln's birthday. That's and how you remember? It's sort of a liberation for me. And we remember what Lincoln did to try to liberate people. Yeah somewhat of a liberation for me that Stephanie Bressler saved me. She saved me from myself. And uh, a guy told me one time, without her, you'd be living in a drainage ditch. I mean, do you and think unequivocally, un- un- undoubtedly, that that, oh, yeah. that your wife... Oh, I was headed. I was headed for trouble. Yeah, I was headed for trouble. Because I was always on an edge that didn't have the responsible thought process Back off. I mean, were you were, I would was, go were you were you living like the easy rider lifestyle, and she was, and she kind of came living, in to give you structure. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, I was living in a house called Uncle Willie's home for wayward boys, and these guys. I don't trust Uncle Willie at all. He was a blues guitar player. He was oh, a, that Uncle. No, you don't know this guy. He was a blues guitar player. He was a door gunner in Vietnam in Holy a helicopter. Shit. Uh, they were selling weed, and the only room they had left in their house, they rented to me. And I went into the room, and I looked, and it was all aluminum foil and different color uh, 
What? Pins. It was where they had their grow for the weed, the lights. And oh, okay. Oh, nice. Oh. So I had like the aluminum foil room. And I thought they were all, trying to stop the aliens. No, and all, and all I had left from when I got evicted from my apartment was the bed because I hadn't paid for the bed yet. And I wasn't going to give it to, and I don't want to get into this. I didn't want to give it to my ex-wife. She was still my wife at the time. Right. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be damned if I was going to give up the bed right. uh, that I have to pay for. But ultimately, Uncle Willie gave me the room. Uh, Stephanie uh, saved me. And when I went back to pick up my belongings at Uncle Willie's home for Wayward Boys, there were curtains in the window and, and a woman with an apron opened the door. And I said, I take it Uncle Willie no longer lives here. And she said, that's correct. They were, they were evicted and uh, there's nothing here for you. So a lot of my belongings were in boxes, writing, uh, some of my early creativity. And that was all gone. But what, Stephanie saved me. Absolutely saved my life. What, what, Still what, saves my what, life. What made you? What made you? I mean, I mean, one thing you gotta, you gotta, and I'm sure you acknowledge this is that you know, a lot of marriages don't last. Oh, absolutely. That long, mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and it's and it's and it's and it's so nice to hear. That, that you guys that that love is still there and oh it is it is yeah. it, it's 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 love it's respect it's it's maturity it's it's working together and living together and 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 really committing to each other we like each other that's the other thing too yeah but she had been married before I was married before and uh, that's how you learn yeah. in 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 my reckless times I'd say to young people. Get married early. Get it out of your system. Yeah. Get divorced. Get out of your system. Then yeah. go on about be your a bachelor life. for the rest okay. of your life. <laughs> but the fact <laughs> is. She had work she wanted to do. She's a, a longtime uh, former uh, tenured college professor, uh, political scientist, women's studies. She's an activist. She's always been a community activist. But she had work she wanted to do. I had work I wanted to do. And as a result, no kids, no pets, no debts, and no ties to bind us, to tame us, to keep us from being unleashed into the community, to let the community know this is what you're doing right, and this is what you're doing wrong, and this better change. So we're doing that in our golden years. <laughs> yeah, but, but even but even at the start of your relationship, Absolutely. it was like there was there was there was, you know, you, when you fight war, you fight it on multiple fronts. Yeah. You know, you were you were on the journalism side, and she was more, I guess, on the activism side. I, I was on the nothing side. I, I had no job. Oh, you were just fucking lost. I, I, I had no job. Uh, I had I had been hired as a as a as a reporter at a weekly paper, but I didn't really have the experience. I didn't have the background. The guy who hired me was an absolute mercenary journalist. He was as good as anybody I've ever met. But he had no scruples. He had no morals. He would go down and identify himself as a, a, a retired army major to see if he could get information. He would lie. He would do all of what you don't do as a good, responsible, moral, decent, honest journalist. But he fired me because I wasn't that quick and I wasn't really, he could see, willing to, to run that game. So I, I mean, got is, there in, is there an integrity line that you're like, I big don't want to cross big that? Big time, absolutely. Always has been, always will be. If you don't have integrity, you don't have anything. Right. So eventually, I worked my way back into that same weekly newspaper and ultimately got fired again from the weekly paper because I was starting to develop a persona. I was starting to develop who I was as a journalist. And I had in my mind a certain kind of journalism. I'm an opinion guy, I'm a commentator, but I'm a good digger, I'm a good reporter. Right. But I did not want to be the straight up and down clerical clerk of fact. Sure. I have all the respect in the world for people who do the grunt reporting, people who go out, and, and sort through all the documents and the information. But I wanted to and do more. And it's thankless. I wanted to do yeah. more. I wanted to make sure after I got my information, then I was going to draw conclusions. Then I was going to tell you what I thought about what I found. Then I was going to use my voice as a commentator, as a columnist, and that's what I fought to get into. And a lot of people don't understand that aspect of journalism. A lot of people don't think opinion commentary is journalism. Well, it mean, shows what it, fools they are. But has it been bastardized? Yeah, it has been. And I'll tell you more about that later. The issue to me was not only getting the truth out, but, but telling the truth as someone who cares about the truth and wants to impress upon you how important this information is. Don't put yourself in the story. 
Why not? I'm a commentator. I'm a columnist. I yeah. put myself in the middle of all kinds of situations because that's the way I got the information to the people who needed to know it. I often say I have the utmost respect for the person who makes a chair, like the yeah. chair you're sitting in. It's got nice straight arms, and that's a craft. And it's a strong it's chair, art. and you sit in it. That's the craft of making the chair. The art is when the arms of the chair don't just come out and end. The arms of the chair turn into dragon's paws. The arms of the chair turn into carvings of a viper's head. Yeah. So that before I sit in the chair, I see the eyes of the serpent moving, and I decide whether to sit with the serpent. That's art. The craft, it's just the chair. But the art is what you do beyond the chair. And that's the same with journalism. That's the same with writing or music or video. It's the same with living your own life in the shadow of the serpent that can hurt you and kill you and take you out. Do you look at the serpent in the eye? Do you see the dragon? Do you face the dragon? If you plan to slay the dragon, you better face the dragon. Yeah. And that's the way I view art. Now, was that... now? In that period of time in your life, was it was it very, like, how long did it take you to find your voice and to have your voice be accepted? It's tough. It's hard because you it's have not, to Because I think there's a lot of journalists out there yep. that want to do that. Yep. Too many give up. Yeah. yeah. Too many take on other responsibilities that warrant their giving up. And and, and I, I love kids and I, and I get along with smart, nice kids. But often people but who have pricks. children, yeah. often, no, I have no time. I'm just no, I have no time for little kids who are a little smart, uh, wise. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't have any time for it. I yeah. don't want to be around kids like that. Mm -hmm. I, I want kids who are nice kids, who are smart in the sense that they're interested. And that's, to me, the and gauge respectful, for not just to you, to everybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want that. But, but all too often what happens, people get married early. They have children early. They... they tie themselves in to what they might very well want, and I hope they do want that. They lock themselves in sometimes to traditions that are not amenable to yeah. stepping out of bounds. They, they lock themselves in to the way their parents have lived and their grandparents have lived. They, they, they get immersed in their community in ways that for them might be wonderful. But for the outlaw, it's not wonderful. And... I was always an outlaw in the sense that you make some concessions. You learn to play the game, but you never, ever give up on what your drive is, what your motivation is, what your goal, if you want to call it a goal, is. And for me, it was having that forum to say what needed to be said because I had something to say. I had something to say. Corbett had something to say. And I was fortunate in having a handful of bosses who recognized that spark, that fire, appreciated it, and respected it. And as a result, I was able to do it. But you had to push to do it. And I had to be fortunate enough to find people who recognized it. All too often right now, in mainstream media, local journalism in Northeastern Pennsylvania, I don't think that exists. Well, no, it. it does not. It <laughs> I'm sure he knows about the new purchase. You know about that new purchase? I told you about it. I'm up on everything. Okay. I'm yeah. very familiar. And and corporate and, media is uh, is the devil in many ways. Well, I mean, I, I remember I remember seeing like uh, 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 what's his name Wallace from 60 Minutes. It, you know, he's like it, the news is supposed to lose money. We're supposed to inform. I have a friend. Yeah. Who was one of my mentors? Yeah. And he's responsible for me going to California. He was a, pub he was a publisher in uh, Wilkes-Barre, the Times Leader. Right. He's, he's the dean of the Canipiac Journalism School now, Mark Contreras. And he said to me one day, Corbett, you're a non-revenue producer. I said, what did you just call me? <laughs> what did you say to me? A non-revenue producer? He laughed. He said, you're not the business end of it. But he understood the need, the role for that kind of of dynamite, that kind of explosion that says, go out there. And that's what he said to me when he asked me if I wanted to go to California. Do you want to go out there and spread truth and light on the frontier? 
I said, like Zorro. <laughs> yeah, and that's what I did. But then, after five years at a rotten little newspaper on the central coast of California, he was no longer my mentor. I knew I was safe as long as he was working in the big corporate office and, right. s- and sort of could protect me. But when he went to another corporation, I knew I was dead. Right. I thought the posse had me. And the paper was sold to an outfit out of Iowa, the children of the corn. And they came in and yeah. they looked with these vacant eyes. And I thought, oh, I'm dead. Oh, yeah. I'm dead. These people hate me. Yeah. And then I was walked into the publisher's office and the human resources woman was sitting there. And I said to the publisher, did I do something wrong? And she said, oh, no, you're a treasure. That's what she really? said. Really? Wow. You're a treasure. And I knew the guillotine. I could sense <laughs> the blood on the blade. I knew it was ready to drop. And she said, there's no room for you in the new budget. Oh. And I said, what's that mean? You uh, no longer have a job as a newspaper columnist. Like, when does this go into effect? Now. And I looked at her. Get out. And I said to her this. Do you realize how badly you're hurting me? And she looked at me and she said, yes. I got up. I shook hands. And I left. And I thought, they got me. They finally got me. I'm out here on this raw western edge of America. Right. Nobody's going to run. Everything I've worked for all my life, everything I've worked for, the commitment, the dedication, the move across the country, Stephanie and I pick it up and going to a place where we knew nobody. Right. They got me because nobody's going to hire me because most media people don't want that edge, and they don't. And people even in their younger days who were reporters or, or worked in media as producers or what have you, print or broadcast, as they get older, as they get more tied into the corporate media system, they become timid, they become fearful, yeah. and they become useless. And they second-guess themselves. And yes, that's still do. happening as we speak. I <laughs> absolutely know it's still happening. I know, too. In <laughs> this city of Scranton, <laughs> in that city of Wilkes-Barre, Mm-hmm. And in northeastern Pennsylvania, throughout could, could, our hardcore country. Could we make our way do whatever to you NEPA? Want. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, well, I want to. It's your show, man. No, yeah. well, well, it's ours. Our show. I we mean, your in, show. We come into I it together. collectively. Um, you know, you, and these are things I didn't know about you. And, and it's really fascinating to me um, that, that the stuff that you wrote about was crime, and, and this is what I like in your thing, you wrote about crime and politics, which were often the same. Absolutely and, often the same in and, northeastern Pennsylvania. And, but what you also did was- A pack was, of corrupt bastards. Not in northeast Pennsylvania. This is this is, this is is the California section. Well, I mean northeastern Pennsylvania. No, we're going to we're gonna get to that. Yeah. Capital corrupt, <laughs> capital bastards. Yeah, they're, they're, so, and then, you know, some of the things that you wrote about were um, brutal injustice- against undocumented immigrants, outlaw bikers, Mexican culture, class struggle, agribusiness ripoff, sexism, PTSD, racism, animal cruelty, and other crucial issues. These are things that are still relevant today, that are still in the news today. It literally seems like we hit fucking pause, and now we're back where we were. Do you, I mean, as a journalist who fought against these things, who who tried to speak the truth about it, right? It, are are you uh, are you like, you know, it, it's just the uphill battle, or are you like, I can't believe we haven't, yeah, we're still come here. to our senses about or some it's of these worse. things. It's 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 an uphill battle, and it's worse, and it's going to get worse. I don't have a lot of faith in the watchdogs. I don't have a lot of faith. And this is from you getting the, the and this is yeah. this is you getting the West Coast perspective. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just told you about the children of the corn coming yeah. in with their corporate uh, heirs to take a look at what they called community news. Community news in the Central Coast of California meant safe, and there's a cat display. <laughs> a cat display, <laughs> and and the rodeo was big out there. Yeah, the rodeo was mm-hmm. big out there. So I, I like the rodeo. That's great. The rodeo, wonderful. And then I watched, and they took these little kids, and they called them mutton busters, and they put these little kids on the backs of sheep, and the sheep would run out, and they'd try to throw these little kids off. What? And then they'd, they'd stomp these little kids' faces into oh the mud. Oh, my God. And they were like little bronco busters. 
And everybody loved it. It was just so cute to get the little kids <laughs> and a little mutton bus. Like, like, why am I at a cock fight? And like, I this said, is- it, it was a cock fight. And I said, this is child abuse. Yes. You can't do this to kids. And I could hear the pause. He's not from around here. He doesn't understand this. Imagine yourself in Scranton deciding that the time was right to oppose Dunmore High School football. West Scranton High School football. Imagine the time was right to say too much emphasis on, on, on this waste of money to a certain extent. We have enough trouble in the school district. Imagine if you would take that position. And they're the kinds of positions I would take as a newspaper columnist and took for 17 years in Wilkesboro. I wrote about abortion rights and nobody wrote about abortion rights in Northeastern Pennsylvania. What would the bishop think? What would the bishop think? Well, today we have a different answer. Yeah. Well, the bishop, the bishop should be thinking, when am I going to get arrested? But that's <laughs> another issue. I spent how many years on the radio advocating the arrest of Bishop Joe Bambara? That, that was that, before that guy, the report came out. That was five years, four years before the report came out. He was a piece of shit out. then. He covered up. He covered up. I had, I had transcripts from a federal trial where he was a monsignor, and he was... On the witness stand, under oath, under threat of perjury. And he admitted he knew about child molestation. He did not call the police about child molestation by priests. He did not take any action to protect the children from child molestation. He and he participated priest. in moving the priest who was engaged in child molestation. And I said, this guy admitted it. I actually was on the radio reading his own words live on the air in northeastern Pennsylvania, and I thought to myself, if nothing else, this is history right here. Right. Mm -hmm. Did anybody care? No. I talked to everybody who I thought would listen. Nobody did anything about it. I went to see him. He wouldn't see me. He wouldn't talk to me. The Monsignor, who was his right-hand man, said, we'll get back to you. He lied. He lied. A Monsignor lying to me. Don't you burn in hell for that. At least that's what I was taught. So anyway, that's where that's at. And uh, I don't know where that question came from. <laughs> well, it came from I still think, But it was good. I still think <laughs> the bishop should be arrested. Thank you very much, I Joe. Do, I, I do, too. And, and, and you know, I, I, you know, I... Lock them up. Lock them up. I do, I, I, I do, I do political campaigns. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the times it's, you know, the behind-the-scenes stuff is totally different from the public stuff. Oh, right? yes. And, <laughs> you know... I think you know, when it comes to Northeast PA, and, and, and I've heard other people across the country talk about this, like political operatives and whatnot, and they're like, when you mention that you're doing anything political in Northeast PA, they're like, oh, they eat their young. We won't even go there. Like, it's so brutal. Like, but you they'll, know what? They'll sell their mothers. One thing Dr. Bressler taught me, everything's political. One accepted definition of politics is the way people live, and that's the culture. That's what we're up against. Do you worry that as a free spirit, as someone who speaks his mind, that ultimately the political campaigns you want to do will close in on you? Close in negatively? or Oh, close- yeah, close in on you so oh, sure. that uh, you're, you're a little too expressive for uh, this campaign. I- People know you and your reputation elsewhere, and we're worried that your poison might rub, on, on, uh, rub off on us and the promises we're making. Does I- that worry you? I my two things that I hate are hypocrisy right. and liars. Right. Those are the two things I hate. So sure. every every campaign that I do, I'm like, you know, you're not going to fucking lie. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to you're not going to say one thing to win a vote and right, then, right. and then do another thing if you get elected. Right. Like cuz because at the end of the day like I, money's money, I got to look at myself in the mirror. Stacy does oh, the same thing too. Understood. Um but for you to, you know, I mean, I mean you're dealing with with Fucking gangs and 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 child hell's angels. Molesters. I wrote I wrote a lot about the hell's angels. Uh, quick side story. I used to work on yeah. the show Sons of Anarchy, and we had a, a a rap party, and there was the hell's angels there. They looked at me and they're like, "We thought we drank a lot." <laughs> <laughs> and I was oh, like, going, I'm, yeah. just here, yeah. "I'm just here, man. I'm just here." Like, yeah. Do you yeah. want a water? But but see, <laughs> but see, in all those stories, those are all stories that you you go deep into the lives of the people who are part of that. Uh, a guy named Christian Harvey Tate. One of the first stories I did when I got out to California, the front page of the New York Times had a big picture of a Hell's Angels funeral. 
in Santa Maria, California, where we were moving to. And within a week, I was out at Christian Harvey Tate, Hell's Angels' grave. And I stood and I paid my respects at his grave. And then I wrote about going to his grave. And I was interested what kind of reaction I would get. Because he was shot off his motorcycle on his way from Laughlin, Nevada, back to San Diego. And there were no witnesses. So it was an unsolved murder. Right. That was what I was good at. So yeah. I'm trying to get into what I'm good at in a new place. And Christian Harvey Tate's father called me. And he wanted to thank me for going to his son's grave. There's journalism that they don't teach you in journalism schools. I knew that that gesture of respect, that gesture of interest on my part, that gesture of wanting to know what happened to his son might connect. And it did. And that was in 2002. It's 2018. Steve Tate and I, the father of Christian Harvey Tate, we're still friends. He's in Nevada. We're still friends. And his son's homicide is still not solved. Christian Harvey Tate's grandfather, Grandpa Tate, who's an old cowboy from Wyoming, yeah, he's dead now. But when he was dying, his son Steve called me and said, we want you to come to the hospital room to say goodbye to Grandpa. This is all based on me going to a, a grave to pay my respects. And he said, take Grandpa's hand. Grandpa was out for the count. He was yeah, dying. Yeah. Take Grandpa's hand. I took Grandpa's hand. He said, make sure you have it so that his fingers are over, over your hand. I took Grandpa's hand. And he said, now the doctors tell us he's unconscious. He doesn't know anything. He's dying. Grandpa, Steve Corbett's here. Say hello to Steve Corbett. I said, Grandpa squeezed my hand. And, took and I laughed. Steve Tate laughed. He said, Grandpa's still alive. I said, yes, he is. And that's the kind of story that you can come back with. And I wrote a column about that. But there's That's amazing. That's a great story. The other thing that I, the other thing that I, I try to reinforce on people is perspective. Yeah. You know, like if we, look at, if we look at today's, whatever this goddamn caravan is, um, no, everyone's quick to say screw them, but no one's seen the caravan no one's been in sure. the caravan no one's well, witnessed people, people get nasty people what are mean. it is people but are it's mean. always like yeah. it's always like the guy who's like i hate fags yeah and and then you find out your kid's sure. gay and he's Absolutely. like well maybe Absolutely. i don't so it's mm -hmm. like all right you're but you're, but you know what you have else? an uneducated then, opinion th th then there are those who when they find out the kid is gay i had a guy on the radio and they send him away and he had two daughters and uh he would send them away he says i don't want them in the house i wouldn't want them here it's important that we know who's just plain ignorant and who's just plain ignorant and mean. Right. And the ignorant and mean pose the biggest danger, and they exist throughout northeastern Pennsylvania. Yeah. I wrote more about racism in Wilkesboro than I think I wrote about murder. And people would say yeah, to me. I don't think it's not, it's, it's no, not there. No. And I'm, I'm a left-wing militant politically, but I understand the working class white male mentality because I've been around it all my life. Yeah. And I can deal with that. But that doesn't mean I'm going to stand by and let people get hurt. Right. And that's where if you look at your community, who's willing to really take risks to help people? Who's really willing to go out on a limb to help people? Who's really willing to sacrifice to help people who are vulnerable, who need help. And if you're real honest and you look around and you take a look at politicians and you take a look at newspaper people, you take a look at who's really taking a risk to put it on the line, to stand with people who need allies. Right. And that's always the test. They're the people you want around you. Yeah. They're the people I would like to believe you want to be. Yeah, the, the the voice for the voiceless. That's right. You know? That's right. There's a lot of people, I mean, even just, I was really apprehensive to do our opioid things because I'm like, I'm not, an, I'm not an opioid addict, but like people need to hear like what, like the success stories and the loss mm -hmm. and what it means because I always equated, you know, I think I said this in the podcast with Marianne, I was, I was like, what people don't realize is like when somebody passes away from this, it's almost like a suicide bomber. There's collateral damage yeah. as you move out. It's mm -hmm. not just you lost someone. It's There's the all, ones that are closest to you the that, ones that get are, are hurt gonna, the are most. Be, be incredibly mm -hmm. affected by it. Um, but now, when you moved, when you came back here and you and and you started on the radio, right? 
So you left what the Times Leader to go? Yeah, I left. Do the radio? Yeah, I was I was the Times Leader for seventeen years, from eighty five to two thousand two. Then I, mean, I was. Well, I mean, were you just like unhappy, and you're just like, I need, I was, to, I need to change I was, the venue. I was starting to. I was starting to get tired of the timidity and the editors who didn't recognize what I thought our sacred mission was, what the Times Leader always was during the time I was there. We were one of the best midsize at that time papers in the United States of America. And I started to recognize that was starting to change for the worse. And uh, the guy- Do you think 9-11 had anything to do with that? It might have because I I noticed a drastic change. Well, I was I was uh, very concerned about writing newspaper columns in the aftermath of 9/11 because the newspaper was more interested in publishing a paper American flag for their customers to put in the window than my critique asking why the people hate us the way they hate us. They didn't want any kind of critique. They don't hate our freedom. No, they wanted the newspaper bosses wanted to appease rather than challenge people to think. And that's the timidity that I talk about. It's fear. It's concern that advertisers are going to get mad. It's concern that somebody like me is going to go out on a rampage, but a very disciplined, focused, thoughtful, accurate rampage because that's what a good newspaper columnist does. Mm-hmm. Everybody says in the newspaper business, oh, we'd love a, an edgy newspaper columnist until they get one. Yeah. Until they get one. So I was ready to go. And when I mean, Mark, were, you, were you having fights in, in the editor's oh, yeah, office there, going uh, like, yeah. Hey, oh, yeah, like yeah. stop? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And there were columns where an editor would say, I hate this. Yeah, okay, so you hate it. Well, I'm not running this. And then they wouldn't run it. So they would spike a column. There were people. I was done. I then talked to Contreras, and he said, we got this rotten little newspaper out in the Central Coast. It's idyllic and beautiful. You want to go out there? I took, I took the map that night. Stephanie and I looked. said, yeah, let's go out there. And we went. And they offered you some sort of yeah. cre- freedom to- Oh, well, yeah. they absolutely did. Absolutely did. And the bosses at the Times Leader didn't know I was leaving. And so <laughs> then 9-11 came. I decided to go before 9-11, I think. No, it was before, what was it? The, anyway, they didn't know I was going, but I, I, had, I had agreed to go. And then the bosses said, we're going to change. I was writing three columns a week plus. If anything would break out, call me in the middle of the night, I'm on the street, I'll be there. Mm-hmm. And they were going to take a column from me. And they said, you're going to take one of my columns from me. Yeah, we want you to do something else. What do you mean something else? And I could see. That the timidity, the fear, the the antagonism toward what I do and how I do it right. was there. And when that happens, that's not a place you want to be. You don't want to work in a place like that. But they didn't know I was leaving. And I eventually said, this is not acceptable. This right. is not acceptable for me. And uh, I asked if I could work until I think the end of the month. They wanted me out. And then I was actually offered money to not say anything about the inner workings of the Times leader. No shit. Yeah. (laughs) And I said to the person who made the offer to me, so after everything I've done all my life to fight to tell stories, you want to pay me money, several thousand dollars. To shut up. To not tell stories. Right. Basically. I said, that's not acceptable either. Yeah. I wouldn't take the money. I didn't take the money. And... Ultimately, I never really told any stories about skeletons in anybody's closet, but the principle mattered to me. I'm not going to take that money. No. Because that shows me that that newspaper run by the people at the time had no integrity. I'm not going to take their blood money. No, nor should you. So I went to California, and then I ran into the children of the corn, and then I came back. (laughs) But you you didn't come back to be a journalist. You came back to be on the radio, right? I I didn't want to. Or did you do journalism for a little bit? I didn't want to work in the newspaper business anymore. I thought it would be difficult. There's two bad tastes in your mouth. Yeah, big time. And I didn't want to come back on bended knee in any way at all. I didn't want to come back making any apologies. Oh, please forgive me. I'm Mm -hmm. so sorry. Right, right, right. Ah. And I was able to connect through the radio, and I was able to do what I did the way I did it. 
for more years than not. But then I started to see the wasteland well, of now, Newstalk Radio. Was there, was, when you came to the radio, was there preconditions from the higher-ups? No. no, no, They were no. just like, do your show. Do your show. Don't say fuck uh, that's, and do your show. That's basically it. Although I don't think anybody ever come out and said that, but I knew enough. I'm not just another pretty face, man. You know, I knew. You're a handsome man. I knew. Um, I knew. So what was, I mean, was that liberating for you those first couple of years? Yeah, because I wanted to take the the desolate wasteland of news talk radio and raise the standard. I wanted to bring journalism on the air, and I did. I wanted to, to, to do investigations, and I did. I wanted to break news stories on live news radio, and I did. And you'd think that that would be what the bosses would want. The community absolutely was receptive. Absolutely. For a decade. Oh, yeah, definitely. For a decade. And then came the 2016 presidential election, and I can, went can to Can I war. tell you something? Yeah. This is a compliment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I moved out of the area in 2004 to go to school. I lived in L.A. Yeah. till till 2010. Yeah, yeah. And when I come back, I, I don't know who the fuck Steve Corbett is, you know, because right. I was 22. Sure, sure. Like, when you came here. Like, sure. when did you come, 2002? You came back? I left in 2002. I came back the end of 2006. So I was gone. Yeah. I had no idea who Steve Corbett was, right? And then I became a fan because I was like, this guy is 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 speaking truth to power. Sure. He has zero concern about what people are going to think about it. It's true. Right? right. And and I can't tell you how many phone calls I got from staunch liberals, mm-hmm. staunch conservatives mm-hmm. going, "Are you listening to Corbett right now?" Yeah. And they were yeah. they would do it yeah. every day. Yeah, yeah. Like I downloaded the WILK app just to listen to you. It it and, was and then, it was a connection. But why was but why was the 2016 election the thing that was just like it, it where it changed? Besides I, the fact that we all took crazy pills, or maybe the CERN collider sent us into an alternate <laughs> universe, why was that? Why was that the the sea change for you? Who has who I'm assuming brought in marketing dollars? You had they to. they argued they argued no, but I but I haven't really seen the. Uh, the numbers they they argued that that my political perspective had nothing to do with uh actually they didn't really argue it they didn't make any public uh comment about it i made the comment that my politics got me fired and it was clear it was obvious because people were calling and complaining uh, advertisers were calling they were complaining small advertisers who in my estimation were people who sided with a candidate that i didn't side with and callers would call and if you call me and you give me bad information and I'm working day in, day out to provide you with the most solid, factual information right. I can, if you don't like that, that's your problem. Yeah. But mm-hmm. when that's people started, when they started attacking me personally, then I, I'm good. I'm good at fighting. I, I know how to do this. And they didn't like that. Then their feelings got hurt. So, but, they, was, had, but they had counter programming to you. Oh, sure they did. But it, it didn't matter because my programming was more powerful than their counter program. Well, you were the drive time. I, the was, I, was, I was the person that uh, I like to believe had more of an impact, and I do believe had more of an impact I believe than that anybody at that radio station. No, I agree. And that's, I uh, agree. that's a fact. I'm I'm not blowing my own horn, but it's it's uh, going You're on, on two years. You're on billboards, though, too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like people know your face. Uh, well, and they all know over. me from they know me from the newspaper. They mm-hmm. know me from getting arrested uh, during the murder case with Glenn Walsifer. They, what they was know that? Me. Wait, you got fucking arrested? Oh, oh, that was that, that was back in the the early nineties. Uh, got arrested, charged with a felony. Got my bosses arrested too, which was really good. <laughs> yeah. The managing editor, the editor, and the publisher charged nice. with felonies. They were for what? Well, they accused us of uh, violating uh, wiretap laws. And I was, I was hounding a guy who I believed killed his wife. And it took the cops three years to arrest him. And I think I wrote something like 58 newspaper columns. And on there, this one yeah, thing? Yeah, one issue. Wow. Holy shit. And ultimately, he was arrested. Uh, uh, I will get back to the 2016 election. Ultimately, he was charged with murder. And... During the trial, I was called as a witness because he had called me at my house one night and started telling me about druggies that might have killed his wife. And he hadn't told the police this at all in, Holy in, shit. in, in the two years, maybe, that right. led up to his call to me. So I knew it was significant, and it told me he was changing his story. And he was forgetting what he told the cops. 
So I kept that to myself. Then I called him. He was living in Virginia at the time. And I asked him about the phone call that he and I had. He called me. I think it was weeks before. And I said, I'm writing a column for Sunday. And I was, I was pounding this guy for years. And I said, I want to go over the conversation we had. Now, I thought when I write this column, it is damaging to him. Yeah. And after the column appears, what's the easiest thing for him to do? So deny, yeah. deny saying oh. it. I didn't say that. Yeah. So I recorded that <laughs> conversation. Okay. And didn't tell him I recorded the conversation. But before I did that, Pennsylvania is a two-party consent state. Both people have to know. Right. Virginia, where he was, is a one-party consent state. Oh. And I contacted a, a Fed that I know, and I said, is there any federal statute that uh, covers uh, recording a conversation? He said, one-party consent across state lines. No shit. So I felt that I was on firm legal ground. Yeah. And I recorded the conversation. During the trial, his lawyer, who had been a big mafia lawyer with roots in northeastern Pennsylvania, asked me, in the conversations you had with my client, do you have tapes of these conversations? And I thought, okay, smart ass, big mafia lawyer. <laughs> and I said, tapes of these conversations? Plural. He said, that's correct. I thought, dumbass. And I said, no, I don't have tapes of these conversations. Now, I'm thinking, if you're as smart as you think you are, you'll say to me, do you have any tapes? Yeah, not to plural. Which, yeah. To which I would say, yeah, I got one. <laughs> but you didn't ask me that. Right, never. So, but on the witness stand, they tell you never volunteer any more information than you're asked. All right. Mm -hmm. So then I'm sitting there, and I'm feeling smug, and I'm feeling like, <laughs> screw you. Right. But I also know this is going to come back and hit me. I know it. Yeah. This is going to come back and bite me. I know it. Right. So I turned to the judge, and I said, Your Honor, Gifford Capolini, rest in peace. Your Honor, I may have misspoken. Mr. Corbett, please. Mr. Corbett, please. Your Honor, this is important. May I clear something up? I may have misspoken. Mr. Corbett, please. Judge, you really want to hear that? One more word out of you, contempt. and I'm going to hold you in contempt of court. <laughs> so when they broke, I said to our lawyer, and I took him in the hall, and I told him what happened. And I said, now, would you please go back and tell the judge what went down so I'm not held responsible? Yeah. He said, sure. End of story. After Glenn gets convicted and sentenced to uh, 8 to 20 years in prison, I'm down in Harrisburg, and they had had a special prosecutor. And Stephanie had a meeting, and I was just roaming around. Right. So I thought, I know where I'm going. I'm going up to the attorney general's office and talk to the special prosecutor because we got along with each other. We right. really did. Yeah. So he welcomed me into his office, and we sat there, and I said, when did I tell you this story? And I told him the story that I just told you. And I could see the blood drain out of his face. And I said, what's the matter? He said, I didn't know that. I said, well, it's some story, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> but he said, they're shaping their appeal. And they have nothing to shape an appeal on. But because they don't know this, I've got to tell them this. And they're just going to use this to try to make an issue where no issue exists. Right. And so... I said to him, I knew this was going to come back and bite me. And I tried to tell the truth. Right. Several times I tried to clear this up. And it's on the record in the courtroom, isn't it? Uh, yeah. But I said, if you feel that you're honor bound, that's your integrity, to share that with them. Because some prosecutors might have just laughed and winked and said, we'll keep that between us. Sure. I said, you tell him. You tell him. Right. And he did. And I don't know how many days later when it got out, the defense lawyers and everybody, they went right to the citizen's voice, the, the competitor of the Times leader. Of course they did. And somebody called me and said, Corbett, did you see the voice this morning? I said, no, what's it say? Go get one. <laughs> and I went out 
And about a block away, there was a newspaper box. Remember yeah. those metal yeah, yeah, boxes? Yeah, yeah. And from a block away, I thought, I can read it. it the, the print was, <laughs> was bigger. It was oh bigger gosh. than Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. Yeah. It said <laughs> Corbett Gate. No. Oh, my I still, gosh. I still have the Velox copy. And they went crazy that I perjured myself, that who was I to be believed about anything. And the newspaper, the Citizen's Voice, wanted to do everything to damage my credibility because- Sure, because you're part of the competition. Absolutely. And yeah. I was better than they were. Yeah. And then the prosecutors who hated me and hated the paper because- we made them look like fools in our coverage. They weren't right. going to arrest this guy. Right. Well, eventually they had to arrest him because a new DA got elected based on his promise to follow up on this case. Right. Uh, because of his connections, a special prosecutor was appointed. They brought in real law enforcement officials who understood what right was and understood what wrong, wrong was. was. Yeah. And it was a victory for the people and for the family of, of, of poor Betty Tasker Walsifer, who, who was strangled to death. And the prosecutors who didn't like me and didn't like us figured there's no better time to try to get even. And they just filed felony wiretapping charges against all of us. They wanted to lock us up. They wanted to put us in prison. They wanted to, to, to ruin our reputation, ruin our credibility. And you talk about the government coming after you for nothing. This is a perfect example. And to the credit of Dale Duncan, who was the publisher at the time, and the credit of Cliff Sheckman, who was the managing editor at the time, two guys who I hold in the highest esteem, who are still dear friends of mine, and to her credit at the time, Allison Walzer was the editor. We all stuck together, and we said, we did nothing wrong. We broke no law, and we're going to fight you to the end of time to show that we stand on good journalism, on truth, and on the law. Because they did that, we brought in lawyers. They spent a lot of money, a ton of money. Yeah. I think they spent a quarter of a million dollars at the time, early 90s. Holy shit. And ultimately, new DA came in, dropped the charges. That's, they should have never been brought. Right. And the four of us were awarded a Scripps Howard Foundation service to the First Amendment, service to a free press. That's One of the awesome. biggest national journalism awards you can get. And they flew us to Denver, and they got us drunk, and uh, we jumped up <laughs> and shook our fists in the air, and it was great. And we were a mile in the air, and we didn't have but, a lot of air, but we were good. But those days are gone. Those yeah, days why, are gone. Like, why the fuck? Like, that's the thing. Like, so so there's there's been, there's been you know, I was I was 21 years old when, when 9-11 happened, and, and I remember... I mean, even though I was an alcoholic, I remember seeing a sea change in how how journalism and how news was delivered. Um, are those driving you crazy? No, no. I'm just All right. Um, and then and then because it became twenty four hours. Yeah. How, how do you? Yeah. How do you give twenty four hours worth of news a day? Like it's because and then it turned into editorial. And that's why we have all these people giving their opinions. Where 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 most of the country is thinking that they're fact, which is how we're creating these. These divides amongst Fox News, CNN, and see, good opinion. Good opinion is invaluable. Good commentary is invaluable, and yeah, based on some semblance of reality, absolutely. And if you're if Not you're just smart, pie in the sky no, shit. if you're smart, you got to be smart to follow these intricacies. If you're smart, you recognize what's credible. You know what credible news sources are, and people do make mistakes. And 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 the aberration is when. Uh, you read a story that is later proven to be untrue in a credible news source. It happens. Yeah. But you have, for the most part, credible news sources to which you can go, upon which you can depend. And you ought to be able to sort through it. But what I started to see on talk radio particularly, there used to be a time when somebody who did not have the facts to uh, an issue would either go find them or sit back and listen to people who had them. Yeah. That changed. All of a sudden, people who didn't read, who didn't think, became experts on everything from constitutional law 
offering their opinion on all these issues. And I would spend hours and days and weeks getting information together. And you had and four I would hours a day, it. didn't you? Uh, originally, yeah. For yeah. the first eight years, I did four hours a day, five days a week. Then I did three hours a day, five days a week. But I would very deftly lay out according to the law schools here and according to the Constitutional Center there. And they all agree that this is the case. And the caller would say, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. No, I'm not buying that. The New York Times. Oh, the Constitutional Center. Oh, oh, Harvard Law School. And I would realize... When does that become not a credible source? I, I would realize that people were drawing conclusions without having facts, without doing any kind of real work. They would consider going online to Wikipedia as research. And it's it isn't. Not. It's not. But, okay? but, but I mean, these are people... I mean, I mean, honestly, like the... the and this is the thing that like boggles my mind is that is that like these th- this is a complex topic, right? Sure but if is. you boil it down to say, um, okay, like people who bring their car to the mechanic, right, right, you know, well, what do you? My alternator's not right, broken, right, right. My gas line's fine. That's what I mean. And mm-hmm. and but you oh but you need to change them, you know? Why do you question your auto mechanic? This is what I but mean. You don't question where your I mean. information comes from. I would come home and Stephanie would say to me, Corbett. You're going to really have to stop Does telling your listeners. Does she call your, you Corbin? Yeah. yeah, she calls yeah, you Corbin. <laughs> Corbin, you're really going to have to stop telling your listeners how stupid they are. And I would say, Stephanie, they're stupid. If you're stupid, somebody got to tell you. Yes. But it's not all the listeners. No, yeah. no, no. But the stupid ones, if they're stupid, tell them they're stupid. Yeah, I just, I just watched, I just watched uh, the other day, and this is what I am like. I consume like all yeah. these other sources of media. Yeah, and yeah, this, yeah. And the salacious stuff, and it's fucking C-SPAN, man. They always have the. It, I love the reactions of the of the of the journalists on C-SPAN where they yeah, have to I listen know, to the crazy person <laughs> while they're turning their notes over. And this one lady called up, and I swear to God, I think she was from Pennsylvania, and she goes, "I just want to thank the Russians for hacking the election and giving Donald Trump the thing." And the guy literally, like, he <laughs> finally, he's looking at his papers, he looks up, and he goes. Are you thanking the <laughs> Russians? And she goes, "Yes, I yeah, think they did yeah. a great job." Thirty years ago. 20 years ago, we would have never have said, oh, thank God for the fucking Russians. I know we, people- We fought them for 60 years. I know, I know. And, and I'm worried uh, as, as, and I'm calling myself, now I'm calling myself an ex-journalist. It's like when you stop fighting in the ring, you're an ex-boxer. Right. Okay, I'm an ex-journalist. Doesn't mean you can't fight. No, it's I'm an means, ex-journalist. Yeah. But I'm an outlaw novelist. That's what I am. Yeah. And- as an outlaw novelist, I want to call attention to the world of the books, whether they be fiction or nonfiction. And I get the hard copy Sunday New York Times delivered to the house every Sunday. And I read it all day. And then I spend the next week finishing up what I didn't read on Sunday. Not to mention what I read in the course of the day online from from the New York Times and elsewhere, but I know where to go to get information that I want to have because the information makes me feel stronger, it makes me feel more helpful, and it makes me feel like a better good citizen. It really, truly does. I suffer ignorance. I, I don't suffer ignorance well. Right. And... I don't have a lot of time to listen to people tell me what they think when they haven't really put the effort into learning. Education is so important. I see where... Oh, can I bring you to a yeah, topic? Sure. So I was, I, you know, I, I wake up at like 7 a.m. and then do nothing for like 90 minutes and I'm on YouTube. <laughs> And do you remember Dennis Miller Live on yeah, HBO? Sure. Yeah, he's turned into an ultra conservative who's slipping back. Yes. So he, I found an interview with him and Gary Hart. Okay. And can you imagine Gary Hart's scandal today? No one give a shit. Um, but he said, um, and this is in his, in he, in he paraphrased, he goes, Thomas Jefferson says that democracy will fail without a good public education. Absolutely. If you don't have an informed yeah, electorate yeah. who can have creative thinking you're screwed stephanie is a longtime tenured college professor who uh-huh. stopped being a college professor and a turning point 
was when even members of the academy stopped referring to students as aspiring scholars, potential scholars, and started calling them customers. No. Yeah. And that's really where we are. We're dealing with customers. There will always be good schools. There will always be smart, good students. But so many students now go to college who decades ago never would have gone to college and would have been able to make a good, decent living wage to, to help support their families and raise their kids. That's different now. And so as a result, you have 17 million criminal justice majors walking the face of the country. And then you ask yourself, what did they really learn? You have all these online colleges that the bosses tell you are better than being in a real classroom with a real professor. Not you can really. go to college in your pajamas. No. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. So we're it inundated. Teach you people skills. We're inundated with all of this. And, and it's, it's a dumbing down. It's, a, it's, a, it's a lowering of standards across the board. It's, it's not good for America. I don't feel good in this culture. I don't feel happy about this society. I believe this country is on a precipice of political apocalypse, economic apocalypse, and who knows what in the concept Social of apocalypse. that too. But we can even throw in a nuclear apocalypse because anything can happen. And I'm not a prepper and I'm not a, a, a paranoid and I'm surely not a conspiracy theorist, but I watch and I read and I listen and I see... When the probability goes up is when you get scared. Yeah. Is that, that's when you can make yeah. comments like that because, yeah, yeah. because no one can say whether or not tomorrow we're going to drop a bomb. You also know what's good. What's good about this conversation with the three of us? Yeah. We're looking at each other. We're listening to each other. You yeah. can tell that. Yeah. Often when somebody raises an issue and I come back and I say, well, you know, and I'll, I'll make a comment. Maybe I read it recently and I have facts. I have numbers. I start to see the look past me. Their eyes yes. sort of gloss over. They're waiting they're, for them to make their point. They're not listening anymore. No. Mm -hmm. They're not listening anymore. They're not paying attention. They're, 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 they're off. They're put off by the fact that you want to have a deeper conversation. And that's what we don't have. We have a lot of superficial, a lot of uh, uh, just... It, it has zero substance to it. It has zero... It but has everybody zero... gets offended, too, so easily. And nobody wants... If they yeah, don't gotta, agree, I, do nobody you, wants I mean, to hear think, each other out. Do you out. think you got to pull PC back a little bit? No, because if, if by PC you mean hurting people's feelings... No, I, no, no. I, I gotta, I, I, but I got to ask I, what that means, okay? Does PC mean you can use... Malicious intent. No, can, 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 can you just because you believe that the Confederate statues are our are, are history... Does that mean that you can use words that might very well be incendiary words, and you're within your rights to use words, but does it mean you should? Just because you can doesn't mean you should. See, All right? The way people, men deal with women, the way we deal with uh, racial issues, the right. way we deal with, with gay issues. Yeah. You can use the word as you used the word fag earlier right. as an illustration of a guy of saying- Of ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. But- if you sit down and you say, you know, uh, in, in my line of work, uh, I got to deal with women and I got to deal with fags and I got to deal with black people. Somebody says, whoa, 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 whoa. What, what, what does he mean? He got to deal with fags. And then they say to you, why did you say that? When you say, Be because it's, it's what I feel. I got to deal with them. And they say, but is there another way you can go deeper into what it is that's bothering you without using this pejorative. Right. And you say, oh, PC, oh, PC. Nah. No, no, no. And, and, and I, mean it, I mean it to illustrate yeah. a point where it's like, let's call a spade a spade. Like, you know, <laughs> like, 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 so in other words, like Charlottesville, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. or what was All it? Right. Was that in Virginia? That's the, that's the, where the, the yeah. white supremacists. Oh, the, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, Let me give it. Like, what's wrong with right. calling them right. assholes? Okay. <laughs> Nothing. You know what I mean? No, no. But it, it goes deeper. And, and, and I'll, I'll give you the best example I can give you. And, and I haven't talked about this publicly. One of the most powerful. Okay. When I was writing newspaper columns at the Times Leader, I, I said earlier, I was writing a lot about race. And at one point I called Wilkes-Barre pound for pound, the most bigoted city in the United States of America. Now, I didn't have empirical evidence to support that, but I wanted to make my point right. that in a city of 40 whatever thousand people, it was one incident after another with white school teachers and African-American kids. And it was one constant 
issue after another. Uh, you know, a teacher wanted to rub the little black kid's head for luck, or uh, another teacher called the little black girl uh, a chicken something, or and, and it got to the point where I thought the chicken head stage? something. Yeah. But the use of the word nigger, right, relatively often came up. Somebody said this or the word, and when I would write the column, because I would always write the column, I would spell out the word. Okay. Yeah. Because that's the point of impact. Yeah. That's the word that caused the damage. There, there it is. There it is. That's the Syrian okay? photo. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'll get to that. Yeah. And we had interns. I think one was an intern. And the other person, I think, might have been a staffer. Both African Americans. And they went to the editor and they said, Corbett is writing all these stories all the time and he's using the N-word in his stories. They were black. And I said to the editor, that's the whole point of the story. The story is about the racism that's inherent in the city that they're dealing with and I'm bringing it up. We have to give the bigotry a name. They felt uncomfortable when I would use the word. And I thought, wow, let me try to put myself, I can't put myself in their heads, but let me try to at least understand and maybe I understood it, but I saw no reason to now not write the word. Now, how do I write it? I write N, uh, dash, dash, dash. The asterisk. Or, or, <laughs> or, or I just write asterisks so you don't even really know what the word is. And I made that concession. I believe I made that concession. Let me, let me fast forward. Right. One of the most powerful quotes about race that anybody can provide is Muhammad Ali, when he was being drafted, they wanted him to go to Vietnam, and Muhammad Ali said this, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger. Right. I would reference that statement on the radio, but I wouldn't say the word. And I thought to myself, I'm self-censoring, even though I believe the impact of the word in the context of what he said. Makes that powerful. That makes it more powerful and more yeah. true and more real. Right. But as not so much a concession, but as, as, as my willingness to say, okay, if you don't want to hear a white guy ever, ever, ever say that word, okay, I won't. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't. But I think that the discussion we're having now, it's important to tell the story because- you have to wonder. You know damn well if I wanted to be hip and I wanted to talk uh, and I wanted to just sort of uh, run my mouth, it probably isn't advisable for me as a white guy yeah, no. to no. use that word. No. no. But in the context of history, in the context of, of how the word was, was weaponized and how it was used to, to hurt and to, 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 to lead people to kill African Americans— I believe by downplaying it, you're trivializing the power, the impact of that damage that was done and yes. is still done. And, so and, and, and it's got to be sophisticated enough to see it. Yes, and I and I and I heard I've, I I oh god I hope it wasn't Louis C.K. who said this. Um, he said he said when you when you say the N word, right. you're making me say it in my head, mm-hmm. and you're making me like right, just right, say right, it. Right. You know what I mean? If you're if you're if you're doing it to expose or enlighten people but, but, on but you bigotry know what? But you know and what? racism. Even in me just telling you the story, do you know that the thought crossed my mind in the back of my head? You know how you get that voice in the back yeah, of your head. Yeah, yeah. Don't do it. Maybe I shouldn't tell that story because I just said the word. I've used the word. I've talked about the impact. And don't be surprised See, if somebody doesn't come forward and say, the, do you hear what he did? Do you hear what he said? But, but, the, but, but the intention is not yeah, malicious. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. but... but there are people who won't or can't see that. And that's where we get into this level of, of intellect, this level of, of critical thinking, yeah. your ability to analyze and to, 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 to put into the proper context what's being discussed here. Yeah, you have to have enough cognitive thinking to go, yeah. like, he didn't mean lo- it lo- that way. A lot of people don't have that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where jerk. we're going. Yes, we're this going. whole conversation I mean, that, wouldn't happen on Facebook, that's no, for sure. No, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> and, and is that, I mean, I mean, I mean look, I, so let's, let's, let's get to 2016, right? Mm-hmm. This, it, it, you know, 
there was a sea change and 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 it was and it was in a way that like oh that funny tv guy's running you know and he could say whatever right, the hell right. he would because i don't think he, he planned on winning i think he could say whatever the hell he wanted to right. say and increase his brand and be salacious but i believe a lot of people took you're talking about trump yes a lot of people took trump for the mean-spirited bastard that he is and liked it i wrote and talked because, extensively because I, about be, it but so so my 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 the Hemingway way of getting to my point is 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 that the the Democratic Party was like, oh, he's just crazy. Let him go. You know what I mean? And nobody, nobody, and every time they tried to stand up for him, he said something even more salacious. But see, here's here's what here's what's important to uh, talk about issues of uh, how men deal with women. I'm a comedian, so I'm going to stand up and I'm going to make rape jokes. Okay, right. all right. Go ahead. If you want to do that, you go ahead. George but Carlin then, had a great one. I know. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, go ahead. And then I want to ask myself, who laughs at rape jokes anyway? Right. And I know that a lot of laughter is sort of knee-jerk. It's just a reaction. That's funny. Sometimes it's out of uncomfortableness. Uh, sometimes it is. Yeah. But I just believe people need, if they're smart, if they want to, if they want to better understand the people and relate better to the people around them, people need to think a little deeper to, to find out why it might not be a good idea to, to tell rape jokes as part of your uh, stand-up routine. Right. But on the other hand, if, if you have a crowd and they like rape jokes, go ahead, knock yourself out. Then, then let's go to lynching jokes. And then let's go to where we cross the line into the white supremacist, uh, neo-Nazi, uh, skinhead uh, music that uh, advocates uh, rape, advocates and violence and, all that. Yeah. Where, where do you make? Where I is don't it? know. I would rather err on a side of caution. I really would. And you can say anything you want to, but but there's repercussions. Should, should you want to? And there yeah. are consequences. Sure. Of of what you say. Absolutely. So it isn't it isn't just a matter of of politically correct. It's a matter of trying to understand why somebody might be offended, why somebody might be. Uh, I think I think my question was more in terms of journalism instead of like the American populace or the rest of the world in general using these words that that that, you know, a lot of people find offensive. But what a great example of Muhammad Ali saying that, because like you said, it loses its impact if you don't say his full quote because because that that's it in a nutshell it's 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 a book in, spoken in, in, in a sentence in, in the novel that that i have out now blood red Sarah, i talk about a lot of issues and there's rough language in this book there are rough scenes in this book and some people have said to me why did you need to be so graphic in your Violence. Why did you have to be so graphic in the one scene about animal violence, animal brutality? Mm -hmm. Why do you have to have a character who is trying to step away from an outlaw biker's life and a background as basically a neo-Nazi, a white supremacist? Why do you have to take us in his head? Because... If you, ever, if you ever hope to change his head or your own, you're going to have to see what lives up there. Yeah, you have to understand it. So when Wallace uses words that are these damaging, weaponized, harmful, bigoted, racist words, it's because that's the way white supremacists talk. Yeah. That's the way they think. When, when violence erupts because of severe mental illness... That's what sometimes can happen as a result of severe mental illness. Sure. When, when a voice is in your head and tells you what to do and you act on that voice, that's based in reality because that happens. When the animal cruelty and people get to the point, oh, my God, I can't read anymore. All right. Well, if you read more, you might see how that awful animal cruelty impacted somebody who then reaffirms in his or her mind 
a commitment to fight that kind of animal cruelty. And that's the process of learning. That's the process of changing your own behavior or even trying to persuade somebody to change their behavior. Well, in a, in a, in a point of, of let, let's simplify the argument is, is, is that you, now how long have you been meat-free? Oh, I haven't eaten beef, pork, or poultry for uh, uh, almost 25 years. And I know a lot of meat eaters. Yeah. And when they see how the, the hamburger's made, yeah. they don't want to look at it. Right. So to, and, and I don't, I don't want to diminish the importance no. of these words that, that we, we shouldn't <laughs> use. But that's kind of how the we we need to reinforce like that's how the that's how the hamburgers made like you need how to many remember people, that how many people and I'm not being flip here right and I'm no pun intended about flipping burgers but <laughs> how many people really don't think that meat comes from a pig or a cow. Or a little I don't baby know. I've cat. never asked that question. I don't know. How many people really don't give it any thought? I, ne- I, I never even thought about that. It's a hamburger. It's not. Uh, it's a hamburger. Well, I know all of. Well, and I'm guilty of it as a mom, but all of us moms want our kids to eat chicken. So we tell them pork no. chops are chicken. And we tell it. I mean, as they got older, <laughs> they've learned the truth. But everything's chicken for a while. <laughs> um, it's, it's a weird one. It it's is, a weird one. And, and I'm, you know, I, I love animals, but I'm not goofy over animals. I. I you're, not gonna, you're not going to you're not going to tie yourself to a tree or. <laughs> no, I'm not. And and I know people who would be quick to admit and then give you a justification that they like animals more than people. Oh, yeah. And they do. There are people who do. And then they'll say, well, because the animal's defenseless and can't think for itself. And then, but that's the way it goes. So yeah. some of those immigrant children's on the border, so I'm just saying, what do I know? Um, I'm telling you. <laughs> can I? Uh, and I'm with the immigrant children on the border, by the way. You would figure that one out. I, yeah. I don't know yeah. why they I'm, should. I'm with the Mexicans. It's really not hard to figure out. Good hardworking people. I'm with the Mexicans. When I see the Mexicans, I see the Irish. Yeah, and they and and, and it's like you know I have I have conversations with my family. It's like they can't come here. I'm like it's going to take them 22 months to even get in. Ask like them. Ask them about all the undocumented Irish up in and around Boston. Oh, let's many, throw is them out first. Them? Millions of them. Really? Let's throw them out first. Let's throw the Irish no out first. No clue about that. All right. If you're that adamant, then the best thing to do is throw out your own first because they, they're the, dirty. The Irish. They, the they have Irish. too many kids. They breed. They drink. They dance. Nina. Do you watch? Do you watch? Nina. Do you watch Family Guy? No. All right. There's an episode like Family Guy. I don't know if you're familiar with. I, it, I know. I know what it is. So every now and again, they cut away to like a joke, mm-hmm. you know, and it might last 15 seconds. Yeah. And there's and they're at the Irish Museum, and there's an animatronic woman who's on a on a gurney, and every three seconds a baby shoots out <laughs> oh, of her. Geez. Okay. Right. And then they go to the ex- then then they cut to the part where it's like, well, you know, you you do remember Ireland 2,500 years ago, and it cuts to a utopia. With flying cars and and everything, and then they go, and then one one scientist walks in a room and he goes, "All right, I think I've invented." That's not even an Irish accent. He goes, "I think I invented something called whiskey." <laughs> and then well, somebody takes a drink, and the whole city explodes. <laughs> so like they have, they've had this bad okay. rap for for uh, centuries, well, if not millennia. That's what stereotypes are. Yeah. That's what stereotypes are. And and stereotypes are used to hurt everybody, sure, not just the person guilty of the stereotype, right. Okay, and that's the danger that a lot of people don't see. Right. Uh, Greeting card uh, companies that put out their alcoholic Irish St. Patrick's Day cards have been targeted, and I think rightfully so, by the Ancient Order of Hibernians, which is this large Irish Catholic organization, and they've been targeted for putting out these stereotypic anti-Irish cards. Right. And I really, truly believe that the bosses at the greeting card companies have a decision to make. Should we stop it or do we make money off of this? And that's what you see. So, What's wrong with the card that says Happy St. Patrick's Day? Well, if it's got the picture of the leprechaun and he's 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 puking a green stream of bile <laughs> yeah, that looks not... like the River Shannon. Yeah. And you're identifying this with a with a religious holiday, uh, I ask you this question. Would you do the same for the Jews and Hanukkah cards? Would you I find hope ways? Not. Well, what about blacks? What about Martin Luther King? Day? I don't think they should do any of that. But, but that's what I'm saying. So, so you ask those questions: Why? Why are the Irish fair game? And the worst offenders 
of 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 continuing the stereotype often are Irish Americans. Oh, yeah. It's this stupid yeah. Notre yeah. Dame yeah. leprechaun yeah. with the little pug face has basically and the monkey nothing head. to do with Irish heritage. Here's what it has to do with Irish heritage. That little monkey faced leprechaun fighting Irish. Right. In the fight pose, literally. Was first drawn by anti Irish British cartoonists to portray the Irish as ape like of no animalistic shit. monkey wow. brains right out of the trees. And it was used to demonize the Irish, to portray them as animals less than human. And that's the history of the leprechaun drawn in that pugnacious way. I have way. never heard Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Wow, that's insane. And so when you bring that up to, to the Notre Dame clubs uh, comprised like, of oh. Irish Americans, what do you all start trouble for? <laughs> well, you always got to bring it up. And I say, I'm just trying to remind you of your heritage, yeah. lad. Man. That's well, it. then there's the horror movies, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the leprechaun? There's a new one oh, coming the out. No. There's a new one coming out. So, okay. <laughs> there is. So I saw I, that. I, I, I wrote some... I wrote some questions and, and, you know, I, I, I could talk, we, I, I could probably talk to you for four days yeah, and yeah, still yeah, not yeah. get to yeah, the we're end. Doing good. Right? We're doing good. So, you know, to some around here in Northeast PA, you were a devil and an angel. Absolutely. Um, and, 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 but the thing that I respected about you is that you even held, um, people you agreed with feet to the fire. Absolutely. Um, being that you were doing that, I, I don't understand um, why your your former place of employment thought that it was it was like oh he's he doesn't fall into the whatever we think we are, you know what I mean? Like so was that was that process more like uh uh we don't you don't was it like the, was it like the conversation you had in California when they brought in the new editor when they got bought out? Listen to news talk radio today. Yeah. And then think back to when I was running news talk radio yesterday. Right. And then you tell me what the difference is. And you'll answer your own question. You'll answer your own question. I brought a different standard to news talk radio. I put during the 2016 presidential election campaign some of the most prominent Democrats and Republicans, they were welcome to, on my show. Right. I had people on the air, you never in Northeastern Pennsylvania had an opportunity to hear interviewed. Day after day after day, for two years leading up to the 2016 presidential election. And I'm proud of that. It didn't happen. The TV stations didn't do it. The newspapers didn't do it. The radio stations didn't do it. I had an ongoing rapport with people, mostly Democrats, because they were the ones willing to come on from all over the country, including Hillary Clinton. I couldn't get some of the mainstays from the Republican Party. That was their problem. Yeah. I invited everybody. And the discussions people heard between me and those guests were informative and helped them make a determination as to who to vote for. The problem was the Democrats in northeastern Pennsylvania took for granted their win. And that's the curse of the northeastern Pennsylvania, specifically Lackawanna County, Democratic Party. They're lazy, and I'm a Democrat. They're lazy. I have criticism about them, too, and I'm a liberal. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm a left-wing Democrat. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm a FDR, left-wing, militant Democrat. Right. The Democratic Party in Lackawanna County is lazy. Yeah. The Democratic Party in Lackawanna County is sexist. The Democratic Party in Lackawanna County wants to have it both ways. And they they won't rock the boat. They won't lead. And I look at my two elected officials, Bob Casey, the U.S. Senator, and Matt Cartwright, the member of the House of Representatives, who represent my best interest. Right. Both those guys are timid. They sing a party line. They don't lead. They don't take risks. And... They both know me really, really well. I asked for a meeting with Bob Casey three, three and a half years ago to ask him why he continues to go to that sexist, friendly Sons of St. Patrick's dinner where all women are denied entry. And he met with me in his office. And he said that I'm basically right. 
that there will come a time when that pack of Amadons, that pack of lace curtain Irish men, white men, come to grips with what equality really is. And you're saying this is a proud Irish American. Yes, I am. Nobody okay. any prouder. And right. I'll, I'll put my Irish American credentials against anybody's. Bob Casey agreed. And then I asked when he would take action. And uh, we politely shook hands. That's three years ago. He hasn't taken action. He's continued to enable this pack of white male segregationists, if you will, to raise money, to exert power, to exert influence, to rub elbows with each other in the terms of business and politics. Now, let's look at this. The same goes for Matt Cartwright. He goes to the dinner and enables as well. Right. I asked for a meeting this past March with Casey. My wife and I asked for a meeting. We didn't even get a courtesy of a response. We asked for a meeting with Cartwright. We didn't even get a courtesy of a response. Formal requests for meetings to talk about gender issues. They wouldn't even get back to us. But here's the deal now. There are going to be 100 new women in the United States House of Representatives. How about that? Uh huh. And I'm going to go to every one of them and ask them to help me bring Bobby Casey and Matt Cartwright into the 21st century where equality really matters, where abortion rights really matter. Abortion rights are a cornerstone of the Democratic Party platform. Both these guys are not supporters of abortion rights. Bobby Casey will vote to overturn Roe v. Wade if given the opportunity. I know that because I pushed for an answer, and his press secretary told me, yes, he will. So, it, but it, so okay, so two things. It, am, I, am I mistaken in thinking that there's a, 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 a female, a women's version of the Friendly Sons that I think yeah. Hillary, it was yeah. the first place Hillary yeah. went to after right. she lost. Well, let me ask you this. If blacks are not allowed at a particular dinner, but they have their own black dinner, that ought to answer the, ought to answer the questions then, right? I don't know if this well, is a trap. Well, no, it, no, it, is, it, it isn't a trap. Here's the deal. Even the women who don't understand that equal opportunity should involve them. Right create problems. The Irish Women's Society is pretty much just that. Well, we don't want to go to the dinner anyway. Well, here's the argument, girls. You ought to be allowed to go to the dinner and then decide whether you're going to go or not. All I have to say is this. If you're a male political candidate, you go to that dinner to shake hands, to make introductions, to wheel and deal. If you're a female political candidate, you're not allowed to go to the men's dinner. That strikes me That's as pure discrimination. We have women who want to run for political office in northeastern Pennsylvania. Let's say some of these real women leaders who just got Smart. elected into the House of Representatives want to come to northeastern Pennsylvania to help them raise money, to help them campaign. These bright women will be banned from the dinner that Bobby Casey and Matt Cartwright attend and support. The same goes for Joe Biden. He's been the guest speaker for three dinners. He has no problem with discriminating against women either. Joe Biden from Scranton, a good old boy. I used the word Amadon earlier. Yeah. That means an Egypt in Gaelic. An Egypt means a damn fool. So now, so he... That's hard to campaign. That's like being at a whites-only country club. That's my whole point. How do you campaign for a woman who wants to run for Lackawanna County Commissioner, who wants to run for the State House of Representatives? If you come in as a woman and you come in as someone who expects equal opportunity, your equal opportunity is denied at the door because... The women are not allowed to come. I mean, isn't it really simple just to change the logo to the sure. friendly sons and daughters? Of, of course. The Italians have done it. Unico's, Unico's done, done it. it. Yeah, Unico's, Unico's done it. Yeah. I, I don't know I've who else has done it. I've been to the Unico dinner. It. Absolutely. That's my point exactly. I walked in. I'm like, for some reason, I feel comfortable and, here. And, and here's the deal. It's not a private club. This is open to men who want to make business connections, young men who want to meet new customers, who want to expand their public image, political candidates particularly, everybody who's anybody, four United States federal judges who worked in Scranton have been past presidents of the Lackawanna County Friendly Sons of St. Patrick. Federal judges who have responsibility to oversee gender law, they had no problem with it. 
Well, why do you have a problem with it, Corbett? Because I'm real Irish. Because right. I understand what that fight for equality is all about, what equal opportunity is. And I'll fight you to the end of time on this one. But I want to embarrass Bobby Casey, and I want to embarrass Matt Cartwright. I want to rub their noses in the fact that they supposedly stand as Democrats on equal opportunity. Matt Cartwright posted a Facebook picture of himself applauding when they they swore in the four women from Pennsylvania who finally got elected. So do you find it incredibly hypocritical? Incredibly, with all capital letters. Hypocritical and dangerous. And they want our vote. They want you, if you live in Lackawanna County in Pennsylvania, to vote for them. They believe they're entitled to it. They can count on you, and you're not going to cause a problem. Do you think the do you, do you think that that the majority of Lackawanna County residents don't even know or care what the hell the Friendly Sons Dinner is? Correct. That's true. And, and that might be a, a correct, part of the issue correct. too. And a lot of the Irish women who go to their dinner and and wear their sashes, sadly, do not realize that they are victims in this. Open the doors, let the women in, and then women don't go. Then tell these louts, these layabout lugs, your dinner isn't for us because your history of discrimination still needs to be dealt so, with. So You're the, the power structure, boys. So, We're here to take you out of the so, game. So the argument is is that I'd rather have you choose not to go than That's have right. them choose for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, after, I can get After you that. have the opportunity to go. Now, if you're, a, a, an elect, if you're a, a political candidate and you're a woman, go to that dinner. But rub elbows. What would happen? What would what would happen if there was a female a political question. candidate that walks in? It's there? a really good question. So far, to the best of my knowledge, no one has been brave enough to do that, and it takes courage. Like in it today's will, society, you can Facebook Live walk in there, and, and no the whole one, world no will one see has been brave enough to do it. And then you ask yourself, do you risk losing because you've taken on that status quo? And I'm hoping for losers. I'm hoping that the losers, the women who are willing to go in and risk it all and lose, will walk away with their honor intact, their integrity intact, and they will win. And down the line, people will recognize these women are the leaders. These lugs now, are the losers. Now, full disclosure, I've been to the Friendly Sons Dinner two, I've or, been to one. two or three times, and it, it, it would hurt nothing. Of course not. Have women of course not. The women serve I'm the ham and cabbage. Create, I'm not trying to create policy. The, the women serve the ham and cabbage. They're, they're the, the servers. <laughs> hey, give me another beer, Bridges. <laughs> I have oh, another beer over you know, here. And that's, the, and that's the one thing I found weird. Like, I don't drink, but they're like, can we get you a case of beer? And I'm like, for me? For the table? <laughs> they're ah, like, yeah, it's for ah, you. Jeez, this ham is uh, fine, Bridget. <laughs> Fight like what? another cut of potato. Ah, did you cook this yourself, love? <laughs> this tastes like shit. It's perfect. Um, He's better here's the at one the thing. accent. You were totally better at the accent. Now, when I went to Ireland, I went to Ireland about four years ago, and and we went over to Ballina, um, County Mayo. Beautiful, Sister city. Beautiful place. No, no, place. Ballina. No, I've, yeah, I've been there. Place. My people are from um, up around Galway, Mayo. I was Mayo. petrified of the food. And it was some of the best food I've ever it's, had it's in my it's life. It's because it's changing. It's a it's a different kind of place. Um, when I first went there, I got a big plate of spuds, and you would sit at the table and you would peel the spuds. And my my cousin Mike come in and he dropped a big salmon right on the table, <laughs> and we just sort of dug in like uh, my buddy. That was it. My That's buddy's great. going over next week. He goes about four times a year. I go almost every year. He said uh, he 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 sent me a text message when he proposed to his fiance over there, and and he goes, "It's done." And I texted him back, and I go, "Oh, that's great! What was it?" He goes, "He goes, the steak was so good that I had to, I had to." He goes, "If the steak was bad, I wouldn't have asked her to marry me." He's like, "But the steak was so good." <laughs> it's a different world that I yeah, asked it's, her. It's and, a very and the different people world. are so. It, yeah. And it's weird for a country because we were told, I, you know, there was a, 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 she's in Parliament over there. Her name's Michelle Mulhern, and I, I had the luxury of sitting and talking with her. And it was very strange to see just how politically they work because they don't have two parties. They have, you know, the, the labor. Sinn Féin is coming on like gangbusters. Sinn Féin is bringing more and more younger people, more and more women into well, the party. The new leader of Sinn Féin is a woman. And that, and that gets me to the point. I want to I go over two topics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to go over one topic, then get to the book. Um, you know, considering, I mean, you... you I don't know if you eat, sleep, and breathe this politics, but I think I think you I think you take some sort of uh, 
uh, wonder and curiosity of the I, Victorian I freak show that it is. I do. I, pl- I, uh, I, I pay very close attention. And I, and I love the fact that it's truth my to power. My wife and I. Yeah, my yeah, wife Yeah, I and love I. the fact that you're, you, you speak truth to power. Absolutely. And you always have. Absolutely. And, and rather, whether or not, you know, yesterday you, you agreed with them and today you don't. Right. I loved that because there was no, look, I agreed with you yesterday, but this idea is a very bad idea. Absolutely. I, I like that. Absolutely. Um, so, and, and and it's really disappointing to me because we 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 don't have your voice in the way that that right. that we were so accustomed to having. Right. Um, fifty percent of the people around, well, thirty percent of the people around here are probably going to disagree with me. Um, what what do you think the state of the country is on today, no, uh, December sixth, twenty eighteen? Is it getting crazier, getting better, or getting worse, and why? It's getting crazier. It's getting worse. And clearly, I'm somebody who watches the democratic institutions of the United States slowly falling apart. And I watch the Republican and you're not being Party. Hyperpol- hyperbolic. No, I'm not. you're being no, no. There, there is an attack on the democratic institutions that have historically helped firm up what we, as the United States of America historically have been and and we've we've been bad in many ways we've done a lot of bad things no, as, not, as the not, united states we're not infallible but what we're seeing now with donald trump and with the people who support donald trump is a complete reversal of common sense of common decency we're seeing the institutions the democratic institutions of the united states trivialized we're watching the supreme court take a turn for the worse. Yeah. We're watching a lack of leadership among Republicans. We're watching a timid Democratic Party. I'm hoping that the women particularly coming in in January will help make a difference. I believe that society is getting more and more reckless, more and more slovenly, less educated, more and more hateful. I see the dependence on devices, on the the D- distractions the wrong, so you can shop more. The distractions, <laughs> the wrong that Facebook has done in terms of their willingness without consent, without telling us, using our information, our privacy, our personal information uh, for their nefarious business reasons. I just see a general breakdown of society, and I'm surprised we haven't seen more violence in terms of violence against the government. I really, truly am. It's violence not against new. the yeah, government. Yeah, yeah, From both sides, from the left and the right. I'm surprised that we haven't. I believe the right is pretty much appeased at this point because they're starting to see a resurgence of this so-called nationalism. The right is starting to see a resurgence of, of many people, particularly whiny white males, talk about how put upon they are and how they're being discriminated against. I mean, are uh, they the snowflakes in reality? Like, there's a good stop chance. calling liberals. There, there's a good chance. I, I'm, I'm, I know the safe zones thing, but at the end of the but, day. But you know what? You know what? This safe zone thing isn't to be played with. Uh, I, I heard a discussion, and I didn't want to get into it, and I didn't get into it. But I read about it. I listened a little bit, but then I stepped away because the reactions were so predictable. The issue over the song... Baby, it's cold outside. Oh, yeah. oh, that's I the hate that. Thing. I, I watched, so but, but I saw I saw a response from a woman who said, "If you take a look at women who have been victimized, women who have been raped, women who have been sexually assaulted by men who have pushed, and by men who won't take no for an answer, by men who play this game, and." This song that was so innocent or viewed as so innocent back when it was first recorded, because more and more people are talking about these issues and more and more women, whether they be young women or older women, are are, are finally coming to grips with what happened to them, this just makes it more difficult for them. Now, I say, if you want to play that song, you want to go buy a copy of that song or get a copy and play it in your house all Christmas holiday for your kids and your family and sing it along and, and right. have the little boys play the role of the baby it's cold outside. Yeah. and go, You can do that if you want to. Nobody's stopping you. But my question goes back to, do you want to? And if you're a radio station and you think to yourself, you know what? We're not going to contribute to any kind of adversity. If, if, if we have a handful of people who call, okay, maybe we won't play that song. We'll right. play other songs. 
It doesn't have to be turned in. It's not to like we're major. short of yeah. Christmas no, songs. It's not this us versus yeah. them deal. And and people have made it into an us versus them deal. And it's pretty clear. You can see the people who want to play Baby It's Cold Outside almost saying, okay, this isn't harmful to anybody. When in effect, I think, if you look at the big picture and you look at how, in a court of law sometimes, you'll hear a lawyer say, the scales of justice right. to the jury. The blind mm-hmm. eyes. Take every little pebble that's offered as evidence, little pebble, and drop it on guilty or not guilty. If you think the evidence favors the defendant and, and helps contribute to the defendant's not being guilty, drop a pebble, pebble here. If you believe the evidence is damning, drop a pebble here. And then you'll see where the scale of justice tilts. I say that with these issues that seem so silly. Right. They're not silly. Try to go a little deeper. If, if I'm at a party and I start telling rape jokes to you, mm-hmm. and you burst into tears and you run out of the room, and I say, what's up with her? Politically correct. Yeah. And somebody says. She's a victim. Super victim. Yeah. And then I say, blank her if she can't take a joke. Is that right? No. So the people who want to just write it off, I say don't write it off. Don't write it off. But most people don't want to think. Most people don't want to get engaged in this kind of depth of discussion. Most people want to just have their cup of cheer mm-hmm. and... Uh, <laughs> Suck it up. Right. And uh, there's no agreeing to disagree either anymore. Everybody always has to be right, too. Like, Well, you know you what's know? interesting? The older I get, if I firmly believe in an issue, I'm not going to change my mind on it. Mm-hmm. Now, if I don't know enough about it or there are issues that come up, and my wife and I have these discussions regularly. Yeah. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? And you need to have a discussion. But if I know right off the bat that you're going to talk to me about the... The Confederacy. Oh, oh you're gonna, that's, you're that's gonna a fun me. topic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What about that flag that I got on my pickup truck? Okay. What does it stand? I'm not going to get into the discussion with you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not yeah. going to. I'm no, not going to help you. And you're. I think not everything that's already yep. already needs to be said has yeah. been said. Yes. On that. Yes, okay. I agree. So, I, real. So I want to get in your book real quick. Um, I hope you're having a good time. I'm having a good time. That's, and that's I hope, what it is. And I, and, I, and I hope that you'll come back because I'd like to. I know. Like this to, is so fun. Is. I'm, yeah. I'm like mesmerized with you. <laughs> <just> by everything. We'll get you some tofu. I'll get, I'll get a drive. I'll get, I'll get, I'll get, <laughs> Stephanie offered to drive me down in case I wanted to drink You should wine. have Stephanie yeah, come. Yeah, we should do like once a month or just something. Have or Stephanie once every six come. weeks. Have Stephanie, Stephanie Ste- come. I said, I said they were so nice. They offered me iced tea, water, wine, or beer. She said, well, I'll drive you down if you want to drink wine. And I said, Stephanie, I, I'm trying to cut back on it a little bit. Maybe, and, you know, maybe, maybe we should do... Rich Howells left me drink beer on their show, so, you know, you... <laughs> well, that, I saw that, and I was like, D- do you want when to? Are you gonna, when, yeah. are you gonna, when are you going to light up a joint on your show? Uh, as <sighs> soon as that medical marijuana card goes through, because next month I heard they're adding more symptoms. Let me tell you something. I was in California. I'm happy to not own a gun and have a medical marijuana card. <laughs> I was in California a couple of weeks ago for two weeks. Yeah. And as, as baby. part of my aging, I've developed severe osteoarthritis in my hip and some difficulties with my back. So I'm adjusting and my training and I'm doing all that, but the pain is legitimate and it's real pain. Yeah. And did you do CBD? No, but I talked about it for two weeks and I said, Stephanie, a woman did a story on us, uh, on the book, and on us. Stephanie's my, my manager now. Right. And I've known this woman not real well, but I've known her, and she's a great journalist. She's also a massage therapist. And I said, Laurie, what about CBD oils? She said, oh, they're great. I said, well, do you use them? Yeah, we use them in massage. And she started telling me all about it. And she said, the only issue came up, we, we had a pregnant woman who came in, and we wanted her to talk with her doctor first. And, I thought, they're doing it right. They're doing it right. Yeah. And then I talked to people who said, Corbett, this is really something you ought to check out. 
And I'm driving through Grover Beach, right? And I used to train my Aikido dojo was in Grover Beach. Right. And I, I'm looking on both sides of the street. I said, Stephanie, I feel like I'm a dude looking for a dealer, all right? Yeah, but you feel where, weird about where's, it. Where's that, where's that dispensary or where's that shop you or whatever? Head the, circle with the leaf. Yeah, I was going to say, or and the, the I, green I cross. Couldn't, I couldn't spot it. But I th- They hide them well. <laughs> I, said, I said to Stephanie, you know, if I knew... That when I got back to Scranton, if this worked, if I put some oil on or some cream or some balm or some salve or some yeah. butter or whatever it's called, if I knew that it would help, if I tried it out out here and it helped, if I knew I could get back to Scranton and get it, I would do that. You can, and I, I know where. I, well, yeah. yeah, I know, and I already have had people approach me when I've told the story, but I don't operate like that. So I didn't, I didn't do anything out there. Like I said, I haven't smoked a joint in 35 years. Yeah. And it, it's fascinating. But the whole medical issue is equally fascinating, if not more so fascinating, because more and more research has to be done. I'm very pleased that Pennsylvania has taken the initial steps. Right. But mm-hmm. I did. I went to the Pennsylvania government website, and I read about it. And I see that I believe I'm right. There's THC. THC CBD oil, and then there's marijuana CBD oil. The marijuana oil has a higher grade of THC in it. That's why so, I So it's THCA and CBDA. THC is the active ingredient yeah, to get you that's stoned. That's what gets you high. CBD, CBD does nothing. Okay. So, so are there like in head shops, can you go to head shops and get the there hemp is, oil? There is a pharmacy does that in work? Dunmore I will tell you about right after yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'll tell you this too, is, yeah. is that Stacy, me, myself, and Ernie, Mm-hmm. O'Donnell, yes, um, who was in, I don't know if you know who Kevin Smith is, he's in Kevin Smith's movies. Um, Ernie's back is terrible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we, we went to the store and we got him a CBD oil, and it actually looks like a, like a face cream yeah. jar that yeah. you would get. Um, this is in Dunmore. No, 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 no. Yeah, they have it in Dunmore now, but okay. at the time, okay. you know, two, two and a half years ago, yeah, we, we were, were in, in LA. California. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're like, we're like, let's try it. You're not going to get stoned. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just a, yeah. it's, just, it's like a bomb. And I got a spray for my dad. And did that work for him? Oh, yeah. He said he can move his hands because his arthritis is so yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. And he just sprays it on. And so, and my fiance's a bartender. She's got a bad back. Yeah, yeah. So, we, we, it, the only, the only downside is that it actually looks like, um, like a tan gojo. <laughs> and, but when you rub it on, it leaves you with like this, a little bit of this oil yeah, on yeah. your hands. Like if you, if, like if you, if you're playing with peanut mm-hmm. butter. Right. But I'll tell you what, man, in like two minutes. Yeah. Like muscle pain, arthritis, like it's it's well, really incredible, uh, and I don't know why they're not. Yeah. Well, Mitch, Mitch McConnell just legalized yeah, hemp growth. Right. So, well, see, probably why is we're back to money and power and politics, and and these draconian ideas of what getting high is, and, yeah. and mm-hmm. what what drugs really involve. I really truly believe Pennsylvania needs to move forward faster. And I don't know with the legislature whether well, Wolf, that's going to happen. Wolf has said he would not sign recreational. Uh, New Jersey wants to have recreational. Uh, New York's talking about it now, too. New Jersey wants to have recreational yeah. in the first quarter of 2019. Yeah, yeah. And I just read an article that said if New York doesn't go legal, New Jersey's going to get all their tax dollars. Sure. So sure. then what's Pennsylvania going to do? Because we're all going to go from, we're all going to go to New York and New Jersey. See, I don't And they're don't missing understand. the tax yeah. revenue. Yeah. yeah. Now, I... I believe down the line there's a good chance that I might apply for a medical marijuana card. But you to, don't have to, to get, get stoned. Stone. You can just no, get the you no, can no, just no, get no. the yeah. other stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but what I need to know is I need to know from I'll let you know the pharmacy in Dunmore. I need to know from doc I'm gonna see a pain doctor you yeah. uh, mm-hmm. know in, in a week or so about this hip. And I'm I'm interested in what his specialty is. Mm-hmm. And I'm interested in what he tells me when I raise this issue of uh, C B D oil. You literally pull like a yeah. dollop. Yeah, like a little bit, and then you I'm just... the same way though because I, being addicted to opioids yeah. for my whole life, I, and I have like you know terrible cysts sure. in my ovaries sure. and all that, and sure. I have a bad back. So I that's how I started turning to the oh sure. Ways like but see, that, I'm but somebody that, that. But then uh, you have Lorene Cummings saying that everybody taking all these kids are taking it and getting stoned, and I'm like, Lorene, no, you're a I nurse. did that. I did that 15 I years ago. I don't understand how you don't know how chemicals <laughs> work. We're gonna, we're gonna send we're gonna send this song out to Lorene Cummings. <laughs> it's a song by the group Bloodstone, and the song goes is. like this. 
Gonna take to the sky on a natural <laughs> high, loving you more each day I die. Take to the sky on a natural high, loving you more. That's for you, Lauren. Don't you worry, I'm gonna add some. I'm gonna add some Bloodstone. reverb. Uh, Bloodstone, man. Play Bloodstone, Natural High. Okay. It's one of the nicest soul songs you'll ever hear in your life. I didn't do justice to it. but When I, I add the reverb and EQ your voice, I will be fine. I will check this out. I will tell you more about my, my new singing career. Uh, but the, the issue with the oils, I, I would never take, like, natural supplements and that kind of thing mm. because you don't really sometimes know the what's FDA in them. doesn't approve them. Yeah, you know, and yeah. I, you know, so I'll talk to this doctor. We'll see what he says. Uh, you know, I already have guys that I've run into in, in, in training Saying, oh, dude, I got some of this oil. Bring it. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. Let me wait right. a while. Yeah. You know, you know. No, do your research. Yeah, you, you, should, yeah, you should never be forced to yeah. do. So now tell me. The music. My God. Music. No. Oh. What, what, what? Blood Red Syrah. Blood Red Syrah. Okay. What uh, was what was that, the impetus? Right there. For right this? there. Right there. Right. This, this, this wait, is let, me make, let me make sure it's still in the shot. Yeah, this is a good uh-huh. story. I want to make Red sure Syrah. that Steve's book. Yeah, you, you can talk all about it. I, I come, I come out of, uh, I come out of the wasteland of News Talk Radio, and I <laughs> the decided, Mad Max fucking- uh, yeah, I decided <laughs> I'm going, I'm going to go into a, uh, a, a monastic mode, and I really just ramped up a lot of what my practices are. Stephanie and I engage in in Zen practices for decades, and we both do yoga every day. Sit zazen meditation for right. th- thirty minutes every day. This is for like more than twenty years. Both do qigong, Chinese breathing and stretching every morning, for about ten minutes or so to just get the oxygen flowing. I view writing as a zen art. I view painting as a zen art. Music, of course, it's peaceful. It's peaceful. Yeah, but the chaos is also part of zen and zen Buddhism, because chaos is everywhere. And this search for peace order. of mind, yeah. search, for or, search for order, yeah. is, is all a part of walking that path. Uh, I was in the hospital for the MRIs the other night, and they had me down as a Buddhist. And I said, yeah, that's right, I'm a Buddhist. <laughs> uh, but what does that really mean? I'm, I'm, in my own definition, a street Buddhist. I'm somebody who believes, basically, that everything is interrelated and nothing is permanent. That's my Buddhism, okay? Everything is interrelated and nothing is permanent. So I live my life based on that outlook. I went up into the office in our house in the hill section and decided I now had the opportunity to write. I had no bosses. I had no coworkers that I had to be nice to. And I pretty much was nice to my coworkers. I really was. I respected them. Yeah, yeah. I was a good employee. Yeah. I, I never abused sick time. I hardly use it. I, I'm somebody who for a long time, decades, was a model employee. Sure. My problems came, and you think this is weird in the business I was in, in expressing my opinion. That's right. what I was hired to do. That's what I made a living doing. Yeah, sorry, that's constitutionally protected. I know all of that. So you get see, in business, trouble to do your job. Sure, but business <laughs> business decides, yeah. and and that's where the First Amendment doesn't come into play. You're a business. You have a magazine. You decide what right. you publish. You you have a radio station. You decide what you play. There's what, no you free speech on? in business. No, you no. you you do that. You make that decision. But you like to believe that people in media have a higher calling. Many of them do not. No, I'm almost willing to say at this point, most of them do not. Right especially around here. Sure. But I sat down and I started to write a memoir about journalism. And I got a lot of wild journalism stories to tell you. And the memoir had- you a, come back and tell us some of them? Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. The memoir had a perfect title, Enemy of the People. And oh, that's great. It's a perfect title. And nobody used it until some old crusty journalist put a book out that I don't think even got a review, but- Marvin Kalb, I think, who was a great journalist. Yeah. But he took the title after me thinking it was going to be my title for a long time. So I wrote this memoir, and I just started telling stories about me and about journalism and about all of what I learned as a local journalist. 
because you hear people nationally talk about the importance of local journalism, and it is important. Sure. And it's more important, I think, than ever before that we have an aggressive press, a press that's willing to rock the boat and sink the ship if they have to. Uncompromising. And we've talked about that. Uncompromising, unapologetic. I agree with that. Yeah, absolutely. And for the most part, that's what I was. So I wrote what I thought was a hell of a memoir. And I shot it out. And I thought that the relevance with the Trump election, with the campaign, I told my story of coming face to face with Trump back before the election. I told Did he story. try to grab you anywhere? No, he okay. did not. He ran, he ran, he ran from me. Did he? No, he ran Ooh. from me. Yeah. Oh, no, he's, he's so brave. He's so brave. Because he knew I was up to something. And once I laid it out, we were face to face. Yeah. He saw the, he saw the punch coming yeah. and he tried to run. Hi Donald. I'm from salon.com. Is your hair real? I laid it out. No, I laid it out. What'd I was, you say? I, What'd you say? I was at a breakfast. Stephanie had, uh, Stephanie went to Manchester, New Hampshire. This to, is pre This was presidential 2015. Run. Oh, this, this is was right November, in. November 2015. Holy shit. Was this right after the escalator announcement? Yeah. Okay. And we were staying in a hotel in Manchester, New Hampshire. Stephanie was volunteering for a week uh, for Hillary Clinton's campaign. And I was just going to go up and start some trouble. I was going to go up <laughs> and see what kind of problems I could get. And I was right. still on the radio. Sure. And so- I get up and I go out and I go to this headquarters and that headquarters because Manchester, New Hampshire, first yeah. primary, primary in the country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Stephanie said, guess who's having a breakfast in our hotel tomorrow morning, first morning, Donald Trump. I said, that's great. I didn't even have to go far. We got to go. <laughs> so we dressed nicely. I didn't wear any black leather. I pulled my hair back in a <laughs> ponytail and we went into the dinner in a big room. It was Veterans Day. And oh, I sat Steve, at a table great. loaded with Trump supporters and I said to Stephanie, you sit in another table because the two of us, <laughs> we look like Patty Hearst and uh, uh, Sin Q or whoever it was. The Weather Underground. In, in the Symbionese Liberation Army. So I said, you sit over there and I'll sit over here. And so she started texting me. Did security check you out when you came in? And I texted her back. Come to think of it, no. Did you go through a metal detector? I said to her, no, did you? No. Did they check your bag? No. Did they pat you down? No. Did they have a wand? No. I said, big letters, zero security to get into this breakfast with a presidential candidate like Donald Trump. That's insane. She said, absolutely. So I thought, wow, there's my story. So I listened to the talk, and then the breakfast broke up. And then I walked to the front of the breakfast where he was shaking hands. And I wanted to see if I could get close enough to him to stab him with a salad fork. That was my first security (laughs) test. Yeah. And I was close enough that I could have just immediately, with my leopard-like agility, stab him with the salad fork. Yeah. Which I didn't do. Thank God. And I put that in the back of my head because I thought, I'm too close to this guy. Yeah. And he had his own security goons. Was it a little him. frightening how close you got? Yeah, it was. And I thought, this isn't right. This shouldn't happen. Because nobody checked me for anything. I could have been loaded up with a suicide vest. Yeah. I could have had guns. I could have had knives. I could have had a hand grenade and pulled it out. Nobody checked me for anything. You could have had a salad fork. I could have had a salad fork. And interestingly enough... The distance was very, very close. So I backed off and I went out into the lobby. Now I knew he would have to come out the door yeah. out the door to get into his big SUV. So Stephanie was behind me and I maneuvered my way up to the very front of the line. And there I saw the custard yellow hair coming out. And he oh, is that what you call way. it? Custard yellow? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yellow matter custard. Oh. Dripping from a dead dog's eye. Somebody said it was a... Uh, you know what I just gave you, don't you? No. That's uh, Beatles lyrics. Oh, Jimmy, the guy who runs the yellow studio. Matter, yellow matter custer, dripping it? from a dead dog's eye. See how they run like pigs from a gun. See how they fly. So, I, who, I'm who, crying. Oh, I know that I'm song. Crying. So anyway, yellow custard hair coming my way. And there were two Manchester police officers and Trump's goons. But... He was along the line. He was doing autographs. He was signing books. 
And I was right there. And when he got as close as you are to me, I said, Mr. Trump, can I ask you a question? And he didn't even look up, but he heard me. Yeah. And I thought, I got his attention. He knows there's somebody waiting for him. Right. And he got a little closer. And I said, Mr. Trump, can I ask you a question about border security? And nothing. Now he got real close, and I said, Mr. Trump, can I ask you a question? He looked up real quick, and he said, who are you with? And I said, WILK News Radio in Scranton. And I saw it, that I was nobody, but he didn't know it until I told him. And then I sensed he's going to run. And I thought, time to throw the question, Corbett. And I said, Mr. Trump, how do you expect to secure the southern border, when you couldn't even secure the scrambled eggs on a buffet table. And <laughs> he, he flushed real red. And I thought, I got you now, I got you now. I said, you had no security coming into this breakfast. No security wanted us. Nobody checked bags. How can you secure the Mexican border when you couldn't secure the buffet table? And he was red. He looked like he was going, his head was going to explode. And he ran out the door and jumped into the SUV. And that's I thought, awesome. mission accomplished. That's mission awesome. Accomplished. That's awesome. So that's when I, uh, I met up with Trump. And then later, Stephanie and I were up in New York for, uh, I don't know what it was. And Trump Plaza, there it was. I said, Stephanie, let's go in. We got to go in. And she said, you can't even walk in front. The cops had the whole area. I said, you see that sign? It's in neon in the window, open to the public, Starbucks. I said, they can't stop us from going into Trump Tower. Mm -hmm. So I went to the cop and I said, uh, is it okay? I said, there's a bar in there. Is it okay if I go in there for a drink? And the cop said, if you bring me back one. I mm -hmm. said, yes, sir. So he let us <laughs> right Holy through. Holy sheep shit. Most people think when they see cops, you can't get in. You always ask. You always try to get in. Sure. So we went into Trump Tower. They at least did the... Uh, security wand us. We went up the escalator, and all of a sudden, I saw all these poinsettia plants that were set up around Trump Tower, and they were mostly dead. And so I did a video about the dead plants in Trump Tower, and if he can't take care of the poinsettias at Christmas, how can he take care of America? And needless to say, that video that I showed over the WILK Facebook page that did not en enamor me to a number of his most pathetic supporters. So anyway, I had all that in the book. It's in the memoir. That's fucking incredible. I went, I went to the OJ trial for the first week. Uh, I, I, I wrote a column about OJ's mother and Nicole's mother, the murder victim, meeting for the first time in a courthouse hallway. I, I wrote great. I covered a Michael Jackson trial for four months. I was in a courtroom with Michael Jackson every day for four months. Wow. He invited awesome. me to Neverland. I, Don't go. I went. No, <laughs> no you went. didn't. Oh, I did. Did you and, see the monkey Bobo or whatever his no, name is? No, no, but I went. I was supposed to go because Michael thought I was on his side, and ultimately, as the evidence came out, I was convinced he was guilty liberal that I was right. and am. And his PR person, Raymond Bain, contacted me and said, Michael is reading your columns and he really likes what you have to say. He'd like you to come out to Neverland. There's just a handful of journalists. There were three and I was the fourth. Me, Geraldo Rivera, uh, a woman by the name Get of... Uh, of yeah, I forget. Uh, uh, Deutsch, Linda Deutsch. She was a long time AP reporter. I forget who the other one was. And I said, yeah, sure, I'll come out. Well, by the time I got to the turnoff on this Figueroa Road, there were nothing but satellite trucks. And I thought the word got out. So there were like 100 journalists from all over the world waiting at the gate. Right. And Raymond Bain decided to let us all in. Okay? The four of you or all uh, the, the All of us. Uh. But when she was deciding to let us in, she's passing out papers. And I said, what's this? And it's a, a non-disclosure agreement. And I said, we're going into Neverland? And we're signing a non-disclosure agreement as members of the press? That's not how it works. Yeah. I said, are you crazy? And there was Geraldo standing there. And I said, you're a lawyer. Can't you do something about this? And he said, well, you know, my attorneys take care of this. I said, you're not signing this, are you? Well, you know, I said, man, I am telling you. And I thought, what a punk. Yeah. All right. Geraldo's <laughs> going to sign the non-disclosure agreement. And then he's going to because he can't of write the, about. Well, he, he would find some way. And I said, I'm not doing it. And I turned around and I said, if anybody in this crowd signs this ridiculous agreement, you ought to turn in your press card. And a couple of the photographers said, yeah, good for you, man. Somebody got to stand up. Then Raymond changed her mind, which was good. So in we went. 
And all of a sudden, there I was in Neverland. And the the merry-go-rounds going around. It's going, boop, 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 boop. <laughs> and I had my phone on, and I was calling Stephanie. I was saying, Stephanie, Stephanie, listen to this. Boop, 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 boop. And I said, Stephanie, can I get on a merry-go-round, please? Can I, can I, please, can I? She said, Corbett, stop calling me, man. Stop calling me. <laughs> so then I went into the movie theater because... He had a private movie theater, and it was like a wall full of candy bars, and it was all free. And all the little, they brought all these little, mostly black and, and, and Latino kids in from East L.A. and L.A. and Compton, brought them all in by the busloads and just turned them loose. And so they had all the candy they wanted. And the movies, they could go in, they could run all over. And by the merry-go-round, there were all these ice cream stands that the little kids could just run and get all the ice cream that they could grab. And I thought, I see exactly what's happening here. And there were two great reporters, Maureen Orth, who was a great reporter for uh, Vanity Fair. Uh, she did a book on the killing of Versace that they just oh, made into yeah, a series. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Johnny Versace, yeah. 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 So Maureen Orth and Diane Diamond, who used to be with Court TV, and they're both great. And they know more about Michael Jackson than anybody. And Maureen Orth said to me, you know what he's doing, Diane? You? you know what he's doing? I said, well, I think I do. He's, he's, he's setting up kids to see who gets super excited who catches his eye, he will decide who will become his special friend. So if he sees the little kid all excited. Wait, it's an audition? Yeah. Oh. And the kid that gets so excited about the candy and the ice cream and who he likes, then he will bring them out for his special friendship. Don't bring the press there for it that. Is, man. Well, we yeah. saw it. So I wrote all about all of this. And as a result, Michael was acquitted on 14 charges. And I was sitting like behind LaToya and behind Janet and... I was watching everything, so it was a trip. It was a real trip. Wow. Uh, but I got, I got attacked by a cop while I was in Santa Maria. Uh, I was on a Geraldo show uh, eventually really? to talk about the cop attacking me. Uh, I, I, I made a lot of good friends and a lot of good connections out there, and I learned a lot. And Michael never lands in the book, Blood Red Shara. So to make a long <laughs> well, story we got, short. We got five minutes before I run out of tape. Yeah, make a long story short. Nobody was interested in the personal memoir, the journalism memoir. I wrote a crazy novel called Patty's Day in Trump Town about the Irish and Wilkes-Barre and how they contributed to putting Trump in the White House. I thought this was a classic. I thought they'd like it in Ireland. I still think they might. Uh, nobody wanted to publish it. No major publisher, no, no agent. Then I sat down and Stephanie said, I want to go back to California. Do you think you can get somebody interested in your crazy California experiences? I put it all together in Blood Red Syrah, all my experiences, a gruesome California wine country thriller, and shot it to a small publisher, uh, Aventura Press. They're a small, traditional, no-frills publisher, and she said, let's do it. So we got it, and we shot it out, and there are some mistakes in this first edition, which I believe are being corrected as we speak, but no major mistakes. This is a wild, chaotic, psychedelic run through chaos in the search for peace of mind and enlightenment. The issues I address are issues that relate to people in Scranton, northeastern Pennsylvania, and everywhere in the country, but it's a pure California book. I'm working on a sequel right now. We just got invited to the Los Angeles Times Festival of Books in April. Yeah, congratulations. Thank yeah, you, man. Congratulations. We'll be, able, we'll be able to sell that book to, to be part of this. It's the biggest book festival in the country. I'm hoping to interest some Mexican publishers to do this in Spanish, to get it circulating in Mexico, because there's a lot of Mexican culture here. And my favorite patron saint, Jesus Malverde, he's the Mexican Robin Hood. He is the saint that the narco traffickers have embraced. But my character, Jesus Zarate, he wants to take back Jesus Malverde from the narco traffickers and present them him to the people, the poor, the sick, the vulnerable, the people we need to continue to help. And that's what that book is all about. Now, how much of your now how much of your experiences as a journalist leads you all to, to good fiction, to fictionalize? All good fiction is based on reality. So, if somebody sees himself or herself in that novel, that's their problem, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So what's next for Steve Corbett before you come back and, and talk with I us got, again? I got, a, I got a reading at the Oosterhout Library in Wilkes-Barre on the 15th, I believe, of December. I'll be at the Center City Wine Cellar tomorrow night, which is Friday, uh, for uh, first Friday, uh, whatever the date is today. We are Monday. What's the date? <laughs> Uh, it 13. is the 6th, tomorrow's the 7th. Uh, tomorrow's the 7th. 8, 9, 10, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. be live on the yeah. 10th with this. Yeah, okay, so that's real good. So I'll be at the Center City Wine Cellar tomorrow night. 
uh, from 5 to 9. We'll be signing and selling books and talking about what's in it. And anybody who wants to get in touch with me, bloodredsarad.com. You can send me emails. That's the website. It's a great website. The circles on the book, by the way, look like wine glass stains. They're the Japanese Zen Enso, the circle that has no beginning and has no end. So, so that's what so you're where, saying. So is, can, can you get this on Amazon? Amazon, Apple Barnes Books, & Noble. You can order it bam. through any bookstore. You can get it anywhere you want Do to. Do you have a Facebook page, too? There's a, there's a Blood Red Syrah Facebook page. Great. There is the, the Blood Red Syrah website is great, bloodredsyrah.com. I write a blog every week that gives you a little bit of behind the scenes of what's happening with the novel and what goes into putting this together and these issues that are relevant because we live in uh, tortured times and we better get it right or we're done. Do you feel a compulsion right now to kind of get back to your to, no. to your voice? No. My voice is as an outlaw novelist. I want to let people realize. So you don't want to do no. radio or anything No, no. I'm done. I'm done with mainstream media. I think that the future lies in, in what you're doing. I think the future lives in in bands, alternative bands, metal bands. I hooked up with a dude by the name of Ken Ebersol, who's with Prosody. They're a Scranton-based metal band. And I wrote a song, The Ballad of Wally Wilson, who was my protagonist. And it's a crazy song about this serial killer. These guys were in a studio with it Friday night, and they put it together. They're hoping to debut The Ballad of Wally Wilson, the song of Blood Red Syrah, on January 11th at the V-Spot. And I will be helping scream some torturous, <laughs> self-inflicted background to the chorus Please the night that they put this Please out. Please let us know. Yeah, so Prosody is a heavy metal, thrash, death, in-your-face band. And my training buddy, Chris Rosinko, plays guitar. But I will help them inflict this song on the masses who too often are asses and don't you ever forget it. Do you feel, do you feel now like you're like, oh my God, I got a little bit of fucking freedom. I always had freedom. But I know, but I've now got like, more it freedom. Like now yeah, you got more. Yeah, I'm going to let my hair grow. I'm going to wear black leather jackets. I'm going to do everything in my power. Oh, boy. I Woo! might even wear a mask. I might even start wearing a mask <laughs> like them Mexican wrestlers. And I got a Mexican Lucha wrestler. Libre. Not yeah, I got Libre. Lucha Libre. Lucha Libre, see. I got them Mexican wrestlers in my sequel. And I got all kinds of things. The sequel tentatively is called Blood Red Dune Wine. Dune wine. I got a hermit that lives in the sand dunes, and he makes wine out of hoochah weed. And we'll talk more about oh, hoochah weed later. Yes. All right. I have, I Woo! have. It's a pleasure. I yeah. have been absolutely nervous <laughs> and so overwhelmed with you coming here, and I'm so excited. It's and, great. It's great and, to talk to you. Keep doing what you're doing because yeah. the future lies in telling the truth. I, well, let's let's get back on because you have a, an incredible insight. I know. I could yeah. talk to you forever. It's great to talk to you both. And seriously, keep doing what you're doing. Make sure artists understand it's best to not be safe. Don't be a safe artist yeah. unless you have to. Many artists don't have to play it safe. No, break the rules, man. Play yeah. it edgy. Yeah. Ride that edge. Ride that edge. Make sure people understand <laughs> that you're not going to stand there and listen to... Bullshit. That's the word. I didn't curse once, I think. I think I said You bastard. could. Do you want to let one out no, just no, before you I, go? No, I'm on my best behavior. <laughs> We're Wait the degenerates this yeah. time. <laughs> I mean, we can, I mean, it's the George Carlin words. You can't see on TV. You can see all of them here. I'm trying to show that... You don't have to curse to be an intellectual. Being a that. model citizen, senior citizen, who lives in the hill section of Scranton can be fun. But uh, <laughs> take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Look out for each other. Look out for yourself. And uh, make sure that you stand up and do what's right. I you love you. And right. I love, yes. love message, you too, man. man. I love you both. I love you great. too. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you to Steve Corbett, everybody. Woo!